Sergeant, are we ready? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Corey Johnson, Chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Health. The Committees on Health and Public Safety are holding a joint hearing today examining forensic practices in the NYPD Crime Lab and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Jimmy Vaca. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, Chair of the we're going to need some public safety for Jimmy Vaca, Chair of the Public Safety Committee, for co-chairing this important hearing with me today. Uh, in September of 2016, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAST for short, released a report which evaluated the scientific validity of seven forensic techniques, some of which are used by the NYPD Crime Lab and OCME. The report concluded that several of these techniques required more research to establish that they were scientifically valid and that some techniques, such as bite mark analysis and shoe print analysis, are unlikely to ever be developed into scientifically valid methods. High sensitivity DNA analysis, also called low copy number, or LCN, is a technique pioneered and used by OCME for several years to generate DNA profiles from very small quantities of DNA. Contamination and other complications associated with DNA analysis are magnified when dealing with very small samples of DNA and are a greater concern in high sensitivity testing than in traditional analysis. This has led some prominent scientists to oppose high sensitivity testing as too unreliable for something as important as forensic casework while others believe that it can be conducted reliably if done with extreme care. While several jurisdictions may use high sensitivity testing to assist with investigations, OCME was the only public DNA lab in the country that used this technique for criminal cases. The complications associated with high sensitivity testing are amplified when the DNA sample being analyzed is a mixture of two or more individuals. The PCAST report examined, among other things, the analysis of complex DNA mixtures and the use of statistical software to examine those results. At OCME, the Forensic Statistical Tool, or FST, was developed in-house as a statistical software program used to estimate the likelihood that a suspect's genetic material is present in a complicated mixture of several people's DNA. PCAST concluded that the foundational validity of DNA testing in the case of complex mixtures must be established with respect to a specified method applied to a specified range. It appears that OCME never specifically validated the use of high sensitivity testing for mixture samples of less than 25 picograms. High sensitivity testing has been used on mixture samples in amounts this small in hundreds of cases in New York City. In September of this year, a coalition of defense lawyers wrote a letter to the State Inspector General's office asking the office to investigate high sensitivity testing and FST, again, the forensic statistical tool. Only a small proportion of cases using FST have gone to trial, as the prospect of unfavorable DNA evidence going in front of a jury leads most defendants to plead guilty. A recent New York Times article quotes numerous former OCME lab employees and high-profile scientists saying that these techniques were not scientifically credible. FST was criticized for underestimating many real-time factors influencing DNA evidence within a crime scene and for little or to no oversight and transparency in the program, programming of software code. One federal court has refused to admit evidence obtained using both high-sensitivity training and FST and another court mandated the release of FST source code so that its accuracy could be reviewed by the defense counsel and the public. An expert witness allowed to review the source code of FST stated that its accuracy should be seriously questioned. In October of 2017, a federal judge lifted a protective order on the FST source code. The code was subsequently made publicly available and published online. In September of 2016, OCME announced it would discontinue the use of FST and high sensitivity testing in favor of DNA mixture analysis of a DNA mixture analysis program called STRMix or STARMix, which is also used by the FBI. 
Finally, the committees hope to learn more about the local DNA database maintained by OCME, which contains DNA profiles collected from crime scenes and suspects. According to news reports, as of July of 2017, this database included about 64,000 individuals' profiles. While this database provides police with many investigative leads each year, some advocates have expressed concerns that there are people in the database who have never been convicted of a crime and who have no idea that their genetic profiles are routinely checked against evidence collected in criminal investigations. Moreover, it is not clear what, if any, mechanisms are in place to scrub the database of DNA profiles from people who have voluntarily provided exclusionary samples or whose DNA is collected without their knowledge. The committees hope to learn more about OCME's guidelines regarding which genetic profiles can be entered into the database, how long they are kept, and when they are expunged. I'd like to thank Legal Aid, The Innocence Project, and other advocates for their work on this important issue, and I will now turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Chair of the Public Safety Committee, Vanessa Gibson. I want to just say before uh, she starts, uh, this committee hearing is going to look at all the things I just mentioned in my opening statement. Uh, Chair Gibson is going to talk about a piece of legislation that is being heard today in the latter part of this hearing after we finish up with the oversight uh, with the folks that are before us today. The Health Committee members can leave and it will just become a Public Safety Committee hearing. Uh, but if you're here from Public Safety and you check in now, you're counted for the whole hearing. With that, I want to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Chair Vanessa Gibson. Thank you so much, Chair Johnson. That was great housekeeping. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to City Hall. I am Councilmember Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District of the Bronx. I'm proud to serve as Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. I welcome each and every one of you here today to our joint oversight hearing, the Committee on Public Safety and the Committee on Health. Today's hearing is to examine the forensic science practices of the NYPD's crime lab and the office of the chief medical examiner. DNA and forensic testing in general is an invaluable tool in both police investigations as well as case prosecutions. These methods are both a sword and a shield. It is not only convicted people of wrongdoing, but also set them free. According to the Innocence Project, as of this date, there were 351 people in the United States who have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 20 individuals who served time on death row. In nearly half of the DNA exoneration cases, misapplication of forensic science is the second most common contributing factor to wrongful convictions. Given that these forensic tools are so powerful, we truly need to make sure that they are based on valid and accurate methods and procedures. As Chair Johnson indicated in 2016, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, under the leadership of our former President Barack Obama, issued a report highlighting the need for clarity about scientific validity standards, evaluation, and subjective methods. Specifically, PCAST identified several feature comparison analyses, such as DNA samples, bite mark, fingerprint, firearm marks, footwear, and hair whose methods have been assumed valid rather than established by empirical evidence. In this afternoon's hearing, I hope to gather more information on the methods, the procedures, and the training, both the NYPD's crime lab and OCME, and the use when conducting forensic examinations. We must ensure that this testing is accurate and when it's used in the context of arrests and prosecutions, we need to be confident that we've identified the correct person with the highest level of certainty. While the use of DNA testing and other forensic science analyses have been a vital tool in the investigation of crimes, as a city, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the challenges and limitations we face, as well as making strides to adopt the most scientifically valid and reliable methods, procedures, and guidelines. I am particularly interested in OCME's guidelines for the city's local DNA database, specifically in relation to the sharing of DNA profiles or samples with other jurisdictions, such as 
is the federal government. I'd also like to learn about the coordination between the NYPD's crime lab and how their work informs many of our city's initiatives, such as HEAL NYC. The NYPD's crime lab and OCME are both integral agencies that aid investigators, detectives, and prosecutors in solving crimes, holding people accountable, and potentially setting individuals free. This is the first time this committee has explored this topic, and I welcome the start of this dialogue, as well as our future partnership to address these issues, both this month as well as in the new year when we all begin our new term. In addition, I'd like to also state that in addition to this oversight topic, the Committee on Public Safety will also hear proposed legislation intro 1235, which is sponsored by Councilmember Jamani Williams in relation to respecting the right to record police activities. This bill would prohibit the NYPD officers and peace officers from taking any steps to prevent the recording of their activities unless such recording would constitute the crime of obstructing governmental administration in the second degree. I'd like to thank Councilmember Williams for introducing this legislation and certainly for today's hearing today. I look forward to hearing testimony from the administration, our advocates, as well as members of the public. I'd like to thank the staff of the Committee on Public Safety for all of their work, our Senior Legislative Counsel, Deepa Ambakar, Senior Legislative Counsel, Brian Crow, our Policy Analyst, Casey Addison, Senior Financial Analyst, Steve Reister, and my Chief of Staff, Dana Wax. And I'd also like to recognize the members of the Public Safety Committee who are here, our Minority Leader, Steve Matteo, Council Councilmember James Vaca, and we also had Councilmember Jamani Williams, and I'd also like to acknowledge from the Health Committee, Councilmember Peter Koo. And as I close, I certainly want to acknowledge that members of the public safety, although we will have another meeting uh, to vote on legislation before the committee as we end this year, but this is essentially our last oversight hearing of 2017. And with four years of serving as the chair of this committee, the first woman, the first person of color, it has been my honor and privilege to lead this committee, to work with my colleagues under the leadership of our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, to really look at so many issues and topics under criminal justice, the emergency 911 system, Vision Zero, the officer training, school safety, we have looked at almost every issue. And if we have not, we'll look at it in the new term. But I am truly honored and privileged, and I want to thank all of my colleagues for their understanding, for their cooperation, for all of the late night texts that I've sent to many of them, letting them know about future hearings that are coming up. I really appreciate your partnership, and certainly I look forward to working with all of you in the new term. And to those that are leaving, Councilmember Jalissa Ferreras Copeland is a member of public safety. I wish her well in her new chapter and certainly our speaker. And with that, I thank you all for being here. Also want to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember uh, Matthew Eugene, as well as our majority leader, Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer. And with that, after all I've said, I turn this back over to my fellow colleague and co-chair, Chair Corey Johnson. Thank you. I love Vanessa Gibson. <laughs> She's been a great, great, great chair. Uh, so I want to swear in the panel, if you could all raise your right hands. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, whoever wants to begin may begin. I would just ask uh, in reading my opening statement and in hearing uh, the chair's opening statement, these are complicated issues. We're using all sorts of acronyms and we're talking about uh, DNA samples and mixtures of DNA and source code and things that for the average layperson like myself who's not an expert in this field, uh, it's not entirely, and if you're not a defense attorney who deals with these issues on a regular basis or a scientist that deals with them, these are not the easiest issues uh, to comprehend. So I would just ask that I haven't read the testimony yet. I'm going to read it along uh, when you're testifying. But if you could uh, try to, of course, make this make sense to the public and to the folks that are in the room that may not be experts in this area. And with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Barbara Sampson, uh, the chief medical examiner for the city of New York. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank the chairs of the committees that are holding today's hearing, Councilmember Johnson and Councilmember Gibson. 
I also want to thank the members of the Committee on Health and the Committee on Public Safety for the opportunity to testify today. We are proud to set the highest standards for independent science and to share our expertise with other jurisdictions in the neutral service of justice, without favor to prosecution or to defense, with independence, and without any other outside influence. I am Dr. Barbara Sampson, the Chief Medical Examiner of the City of New York. My office has two mission-critical roles, to protect the public's health and to practice forensic science in the service of justice. You have heard me repeat over the last four years that my goal is to establish the model of an ideal medical examiner's office, independent, unbiased, immune from undue influence, and as accurate as humanly possible. Far from being mere, being mere words, the requirements I list are at the core of why we exist. The integrity of the forensic science we perform rests upon our independence, both actual and perceived. In 2007, at the opening ceremony of our DNA laboratory, my predecessor, Dr. Hirsch, reminded New York City about the truth. His words continue to resonate with all who value science as well as justice. He said the motto of our DNA building attempts to capture the impartiality and independence of science. It is inscribed on the wall of our lobby science serving justice, unambiguous and direct, science serving justice. It does not say science serving the police, it does not say science serving the district attorney, and it does not say science serving the defense. Right down the middle of the road, it simply says science serving justice. 100 years ago, the idea of an independent medical examiner was conceived to repair a system of elected coroners that was thought by all to be corrupt and partisan. And that system exists in most of the United States today. The medical examiner serves as a vital check and balance role in the criminal justice system. And our findings must be independent of influence from any and all competing interests, including those of private entities, government agencies, political parties, and the general public. We demonstrate our independence at a practical le level by adhering to a rigorous philosophy of meeting with both prosecution and defense upon request to discuss our findings. As the chief medical examiner of all New Yorkers, I took an oath to serve the best interests of our citizens, and I will continue to meet that obligation by protecting and nurturing the independence of this office so that we may always serve justice without bias. OCME processes all biological evidence for the city that requires DNA or toxicologic testing through our three forensic laboratories, the Forensic Biology Lab, the Forensic Toxicology Lab, and a Molecular Genetics Lab. We are distinct and separate from the forensic laboratories operated under the auspices of the NYPD. The NYPD laboratories process all non-biologic evidence, including firearms, illicit drugs, uh, latent fingerprints and trace evidence. The New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner operates the largest and most advanced public DNA laboratory in North America. Our Department of Forensic Biology is a national leader in DNA technology and research, and our, foren uh, and our forensic DNA laboratory is fully accredited as mandated under New York State Executive Law. Our accreditation is granted by ANAB, a national accreditation board of the American National Standards Institute and the American Society for Quality under the specific uh, scope of ISO. ISO stands for International Organization of Standardization 17025 standards. In addition, the department operates under the FBI's quality assurance standards for forensic DNA testing laboratories. Just this past October, the Department of Forensic Biology underwent an external audit that consisted of 13 FBI QA auditors and one ANAB assessor performing an on-site assessment to determine if the DNA lab satisfies the standards under which it is accredited. I am happy to report that the DNA laboratory received only one nonconformance out of over 600 standards that they were audited against. Among the cutting-edge work ongoing our, in our forensic biology department is its processing of environmentally challenging and degraded skeletal remains, utilizing optimized bone extraction technique. 
We are continuing to work on the unidentified remains of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. This August, we scientifically identified remains from the 1,641st person from the attack on September 11th. The identification of this victim, whose name was withheld at the family's request, was reformed by our laboratory using new technologies developed in-house and launched in 2017. We have also reassociated many remains to previously identified victims this year. We are continuing our work on the identification of the 2,753 victims of that disaster. The Department of Forensic Biology also possesses biologic, processes biologic samples for criminal matters and has experienced a record increase in its case submissions, all while maintaining an excellent turnaround time of four to six weeks for cases associated with crimes against persons. In calendar year 2016, the laboratory experienced a significant 43% increase in cases received over the previous year. 2017 is projected to have a 30% increase over the record numbers of 2016. The majority of these increases are due to the processing DNA samples associated with gun crimes. In 2016, our Department of Forensic Biology grew by nearly $1.8 million to hire 21 new criminalists and evidence property control specialists to test evidence from all guns seized from a person by the NYPD. In the adopted 2018 plan, we are expanding by an additional $4.5 million for an additional 53 staff, of whom 34 are forensic biologists, to address these case submission increases. In both years, we were able to recruit, onboard, and are training these new staff members. Our forensic biology laboratory provides surfaces that are critical both to victims and law enforcement and to wrongly convicted defendants. For example, just a few years ago, OCME's lab was able to perform DNA analysis that was vital to solving a vicious assault and rape that occurred in 1998. OCME developed a DNA profile from the sexual assault kit and uploaded it into the CODIS DNA database. In 2013, that profile hit to a defendant whose DNA was entered in the database as a result of a federal money laundering conviction. That defendant was subsequently convicted of the 1998 rape, and in June of this year, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. As I mentioned, DNA analysis can also be crucial in exonerating wrongly convicted defendants. For example, in 2011, a 1985 conviction was reviewed in Brooklyn. Subsequent DNA tests were performed on the cigarette butt butts and the marijuana roach that had been found in the car used to abduct the victim. The convicted defendant's DNA was not found on those items. Rather, the DNA testing revealed DNA material that hit to an unidentified man with a criminal record. In 2013, the Brooklyn DA's office reopened the case and moved for the conviction to be vacated, leading to the exoneration of that defendant. I will now turn to our Forensic Toxicology Laboratory, which is responsible for testing biological samples from both illicit and therapeutic drugs. Over the past 18 months, the lab has eliminated a backlog of more than 800 cases and has drastically reduced turnaround times for completion of casework from an average of 120 days to less than 20 days. This month it was 16 days, a world-class turnaround time. Over 98% of all cases are now completed within 30 days or less, twice as fast as the national standard. In 2017, the Toxicology Laboratory achieved both New York State and the American Board of Forensic Toxicology accreditation and continues to expand both the scope of its testing through research collaborations and its investment in staff training. Development of new testing methodologies using state-of-the-art instrumentation purchased in 2016 has further expanded the testing capability of the laboratory. Further, in September 2017, with support from both the New York City District Attorney's offices and the NYPD, the OCME Forensic Toxicology Lab was approved to test all drunk driving and uh, driving while intoxicated cases uh, collected in New York City and has nonetheless continued to maintain turnaround times of less than 20 days. 
Our toxicology laboratory is on the leading edge of com combating the city's opioid epidemic. As part of investments made through Healing New York City, Healing NYC in November last month, the laboratory introduced a method capable of screening for 30 different synthetic opioids, an essential tool to meet the challenge of the opioid epidemic, fueled by illicit fentanyl and affecting not only the city of New York, but the entire nation. OCME is sharing its findings with our partner agencies in real time at an unprecedented level, helping inform decisions made by DOHMH and law enforcement. Finally, through genetic testing, our preeminent molecular genetics laboratory significantly enhances the ability of the agency in its direct support of OCME's mandate to investigate sudden, unexpected, and unexplained deaths in apparently healthy New Yorkers. Advances in molecular medicine have increased the ability to identify diseases at the molecular level that escape discovery during autopsy, microscopic examination, or toxicology testing. Currently, the laboratory performs molecular analysis on 95 cardiomyopathy genes. Those are genes responsible for heart diseases. Uh, thrombophilia molecular analysis, which is responsible for blood clots, and sickle cell disease uh, molecular analysis. In May 2017, the Molecular Genetics Laboratory received its third consecutive finding of zero deficiencies during its biennial unannounced on-site inspection by the College of American Pathologists. Since 2016, we have been providing professional genetic counseling services to deliver genetic education, counseling, and support to the families of decedents who tested positive by our laboratory. Finally, two articles from this laboratory on molecular diagnostics in idiopathic pulmonary embolism and sudden unexplained death have been accepted for publication in high-impact peer-reviewed journals, highlighting the role that OCME has in advancing science in the United States. The people who dedicate their lives to forensic science at OCME not only serve criminal justice, they can also have profound impact on the lives of everyday Americans across the country. In 2015, a young woman suffered a sudden cardiac death in our jurisdiction. We diagnosed a genetic condition as the cause. A while later, the decedent's sister was hospitalized in another state with a suspected cardiac condition. Her physicians wanted to discharge her home, but her mother pleaded with the doctors to let her stay because OCME had previously found a genetic cause of her sister's death. They agreed. That evening, the hospitalized sister had a cardiac arrhythmia, cardiac arrest, and was able to be resuscitated because she was still in the hospital. She likely would have died otherwise. I will end by saying there is no better illustration of the OCME than the Latin inscription on our wall, which loosely translates, this is the place where the dead help the living. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. Uh, you know, the, the testimony that you provided today is always, of course, very illuminating, and I want to congratulate you on, I think, the work that you've done in um, charting a course and trying to fix some previous problems that existed at OCME. I have deep respect for you, and I really have enjoyed our professional working relationship with each other. Uh, so what I'm about to tell you is, is in no way uh, me trying to be overly critical. It's just me being honest. Uh, and I know we're going to, of course, hear from the NYPD, but I want to say this because after they testify, I want to come back, and hopefully you can think about this before we get to our questions. In my opening statement and the chair's opening statement talked about a lot of things we want to discuss today. None of those things were discussed in your opening statement. I mean, to my knowledge. I mean, the, the FST, uh, low copy, uh, the concerns around uh, the FBI's tool, federal judges jumping in, a mixture of DNA samples, all of those things which were a big concern and which is what we want to delve into today, that's what we really want to get answers on. I understand that. However, I did not receive any information that that was what you were interested in speaking today, so that's why I didn't include it in my testimony. But OCME is fully prepared to address every one of those questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Before we get to the NYPD's testimony, I want to acknowledge the presence of additional colleagues uh, on the committee, Councilmember Rafael Espinal, Councilmember Rory Lansman, as well as Councilmember Bill Perkins, and certainly also want to acknowledge from the Public Safety Committee uh, one of our outgoing members from our county of the Bronx, um, Councilmember James Vaca. Thank you so much for all the work you've done. You've been a great asset to the public safety team, and we appreciate it. Certainly, we represent a great borough. Um, that's been doing phenomenal work, and we look forward to all that you will still give to the Bronx and the city of New York. So thank you so much for your service, and uh, congratulations, and God bless you. Thank you so much. His name is James? Yeah. Well, I always called him Jimmy. Jimmy. Sorry, Jimmy James. <laughs> joking. I'm joking. Uh, the NYPD, you may go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Gibson, Chair Johnson, members of the council. I am Deputy Chief Emmanuel Katranakis, the commanding officer of the New York City Police Department's Forensic Investigations Division. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Oleg Chernovsky, the NYPD's Director of Legislative Affairs. On behalf of the Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill, I wish to thank the City Council for the opportunity to speak to you today about the NYPD Forensic Investigations Division's Police Laboratory. The NYPD Forensic Investigation Division consists of the Police Laboratory, Crime Scene Unit, latent print section, and the DNA liaison unit. And the mission of the NYPD's Forensic Investigations Division is to provide the highest quality of forensic services to the criminal justice system with objectivity, impartiality, and integrity. To wit, the forensic investigators support the criminal justice system in their pursuit of truth through science. The focus of today's hearing, the NYPD's police laboratory, is charged with performing forensic examinations on an immense volume of physical evidence and to do so in a manner that ensures the integrity, quality, and accuracy of the scientific findings. The laboratory receives approximately 155,000 cases each year and performs examinations on one-third of those cases. The New York City Police Department operates an accredited forensic laboratory. The laboratory is accredited by ANAB, a national accreditation board of the American National Standards Institute, and the American Society for Quality. Under the specific scope of ISO, the International Organization of Standardization 17025 standards, accreditation is based on an assessment of the agency's technical qualifications and competence for conducting specific testing and examination activities. Our accreditation is mandated under New York State Executive Law. Last month, the laboratory underwent a full ANAB accreditation assessment that consisted of 17 assessors performing a week-long on-site inspection to determine if the laboratory satisfies approximately 400 individual requirements or standards. These requirements pertain to the laboratory's operations, specifically the laboratory's policies, procedures, documentation of casework, physical plant state space, equipment, and materials. I am very happy to report that the NYPD laboratory received a near perfect score on this evaluation. This is unprecedented and extraordinary in terms of an achievement that sets the benchmark for the forensic laboratories throughout the country. The laboratory provides a wide variety of services to the criminal justice system. These include controlled substances analyses, firearms examinations, latent print development, trace evidence analyses, gunshot residue, muzzle to target distance determination, and question document examinations. While the laboratory is charged with these myriad of responsibilities, I want to focus my testimony today on three areas, controlled substance analyses, firearms examinations, and trace evidence analyses. As one of the largest forensic laboratories in the world, the police laboratory handles a significant volume of evidence the most notable being the controlled substances testing. The laboratory's controlled substance analysis section receives 110,000 cases each year and analyzes approximately 34,000 of them. The controlled substance analysis section will analyze evidence to report the identification of one or more controlled substances or the absence of a controlled substance in a case. The most commonly tested controlled substances are cocaine and heroin, but the laboratory will also perform analyses to identify other substances such as fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. In the wake of historic drops in gun crime in our city, I think it's important to discuss the testing of evidence related to firearms crimes. 
the NYPD takes a holistic, forensic approach to reduce violent gun crimes. The forensic value of a firearm is more than an instrument that generates a high-velocity projectile. A firearm is an item of evidence with potentially probative fingerprint evidence, DNA evidence, trace evidence, as well as non-scientific information pertaining to tracing firearms via the serial number. The laboratory's firearms analysis section conducts operability examinations and microscopic analyses of firearms and firearms-related evidence. Operability testing is primarily performed to satisfy statutory requirements in the New York State Penal Law. Microscopy comparisons are performed on fired bullets and discharged shell casings to establish a nexus or disassociate a nexus between firearms and fired bullets and discharged shell casings recovered from crime scenes. This is of tremendous value when examinations generate a nexus between two or more unrelated crimes, thus providing investigative leads that would otherwise be unknown to investigators. Firearms analysis will also include the serial number restorations where applicable. Criminals sometimes attempt to render firearms untraceable by grinding or filing away the serial number. Personnel in the firearms analysis section are able to restore the serial number through a variety of methods such as chemical etching, electrochemical etching, and ultrasonic cavitation. The serial number of a firearm can lead to critical intelligence for investigators by tracing the original sale of the firearm. In addition, personnel in the laboratory will perform bullet-resistant garment tests, firearm trigger pull tests, firearm drop tests, and provide expert testimony in cases involving firearms prosecutions. Trace evidence examinations are conducted by the laboratory's criminalistic section. Trace examinations can provide a scientific link between the suspect and a victim or the suspect and the crime scene or a victim and the crime scene. Trace evidence can support or refute a suspect or a witness's statements or produce a potential lead in an investigation. Trace evidence examinations can involve the analysis of paint, fibers, textiles, glass, explosives, and fire debris and footwear impression examinations. The investigatory and public benefits of such analyses are immeasurable. For example, the department has previously testified before this council about the challenges in investigating hit and run accidents because many take place on non-major highways and roads at night without street cameras and with few, if any, witnesses. Laboratory analyses of motor vehicle paint, however, can lead to determining the color and the potential make and model of a vehicle from recovered samples. Crime scene paint samples can consequently be compared to known paint samples from a suspect vehicle or any other known source. Trace analyses can be conducted with explosive and fire debris evidence to identify explosive chemicals and to demonstrate that chemicals were used to construct an IED or improvised explosive device or an incendiary device. Scientific analyses can also be performed to determine the presence and absence of substances that can accelerate the development of a fire. Testing such as this provides solid intelligence to our NYPD investigators and valuable information that can be used in subsequent prosecutions. While I have provided a brief overview of some of the work performed by the laboratory, I do want to discuss a recent initiative undertaken by the department. Over the last few years, there has been a growing need for the laboratory analyses of narcotics evidence and paraphernalia connected from fatal and non-fatal overdoses. As part of the Mayor's Healing New York City initiative, the Police Commissioner recently approved increased staffing at the police laboratory by more than 42 percent to support opioid-related investigations and combat overdoses. This has enabled the laboratory to embark on a new goal to test all drug evidence obtained from overdose cases. Evidence samples from these cases are often challenging due to the presence of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs and other traditional controlled substances such as heroin, cocaine, ketamine, and benzodiazepines. In one recent case, as many as 12 controlled substances were mixed together in some of the recovered drugs. The forensic investigation into each of these compounds in these mixtures is labor-intensive and complex. These analyses, however, are essential in identifying controlled substances mixtures that will assist the department in developing forensic intelligence on distribution sources based on geographical area, as well as sharing information with our partners at the OCME and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to warn, educate, and inform the public of these dangerous and toxic synthetic opioids. By increasing our staffing to process more cases, the information we can learn from this evidence is critical 
in our overreaching effort to reduce overdoses in New York City. Now, in shifting gears, the remainder of my testimony will focus on another topic of today's hearing, Intro 1235, known as the Right to Record Act. This bill seeks to codify a right to record police activities and to create a private right of action, including the right to obtain damages and other relief in relation to interfering with that right. The department opposes this legislation. Individuals who believe either that they can be falsely arrested or have been, excuse me, or had their property wrongfully seized can currently seek remedies in court. Courts have consistently held that it is not unlawful to record officers carrying out their duties. The department firmly recognizes that individuals have a general right to lawfully record police activity and to criticize police activity, provided that an individual does not interfere or prevent an officer from performing an official function. This lawful activity extends to the recording of police activity and applies to individuals in both public places, such as streets, sidewalks, and parks, and private property, such as buildings, lobbies, workplaces, or an individual's own property, provided that that individual has a legal right to be present at that location. Moreover, an individual's right to engage in this activity is regularly enforced at the police academy during in-service training and through the legal bureau bulletins and other departmental guidance. Notably, since 2015, the NYPD has conducted 65 such training sessions that covered this topic. The department does not believe that passage of this bill would add anything to an individual's current ability to engage in this lawful conduct. It would instead create an unnecessary avenue for additional litigation against police officers, the police department, and the city as a whole. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today, and I am pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Dr. Sampson and her team, and also uh, to the NYPD for being here today for your testimony and to your service uh, for the city of New York. All of you really appreciate it. As Dr. Sampson said, you all represent really important pillars of our criminal justice system, and so that's why we're happy to have this hearing today. So I want to go back to uh, the oversight uh, topic. Uh, Dr. Sampson, what is the standard for collecting abandoned DNA evidence? What standard is used? That question is really more under the auspices of the NYPD. Okay. So forgive me, but could you clarify what you mean by standard? I'm not, I'm not certain where. Well, I'm just trying to understand when you're collecting DNA, what is the most optimal way you feel that DNA should be collected so that it is most useful in uh, criminal investigations, uh, and when you're trying to collect evidence, what standard are, are, are you using? The standard that we use is probative evidence. Say so, that again, I didn't hear you. Probative. Okay. So if we deem that collecting DNA from an individual would be probative, which is clear from Black's Law Dictionary is something that will either prove or disprove the fact or point an issue, then we will go ahead and make effort and take action to collect DNA from an individual. And where are the profiles from abandoned DNA samples stored? Uh, they're stored uh, in the uh, local database uh, within CODIS at the OCME. Are, uh, is abandoned DNA ever expunged from city records? Let, can I just clarify what you mean by abandoned DNA? You mean, for example, my DNA on this cup that is... Um, well, when, when, that are probative in a case? Well, when I gave uh, my opening statement earlier, I talked about exclusionary DNA samples. Oh, okay. uh, people that are not suspects in any way, uh, their DNA is used uh, for a particular case to exclude themselves uh, from that case, to rule them out as suspects, then their DNA, I'm sure, during that process is stored within the database that you just mentioned. Is there ever a point that DNA for people who are not suspects is expunged from city records and the database? Or is that DNA kept? I, 
you're ch ch changing some of the words uh, as as you go through that. So first, if someone I, I, is... Uh, I want right. to apologize again. I'm a layman. No, no. I, so, I just I want to be clear yeah. and answer the question um, that I think you uh, are, are asking. Um, I believe you're asking if someone gives a, a DNA sample uh, because they are a suspect in a case uh, and we uh, generate a profile. Is that... Uh, ever expunged from the system. Exactly. And the, the answer to that is that, yes, it is expunged under court order. That's the only situation under which it is expunged. Why only under court order? That's the... Uh, we, as, at OCME, as keepers of CODIS, we are not allowed to expunge uh, anything um, other than under court order. That's by law? I, well, that, that's for the... That's the regulation of CODIS. Um, the local database is uh, not necessarily uh, governed by that. Uh, Florence, would you like to speak to that? The this is Florence Hutner, our general counsel. Uh, Florence, you agree to tell the truth to all of us today as general counsel? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Even not as general counsel. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so there, are, there are a couple of questions, I think, as Dr. Sampson was alluding in the questions that you have asked her. Um, Yes, uh, sam suspect samples can be expunged from the database. Those are expunged. And the only mechanism we have at the moment is pursuant to court order, as Dr. Sampson said. And with regard to exclusionary samples, those are in a, a different category. Um, they are, they are uh, not kept in the same way, and they are not included in the in. Um, are they in code? They are not even in the CODIS database. They are used only for the purpose of excluding um, a particular individual as, uh, or for excluding a, a, a profile that is obtained from an evidence sample if it matches an exclusionary sample to understand that, um, for example, somebody who lives in a home that has been burglarized, um, if that person's DNA is found on an evidentiary sample that was taken in the home, then that helps explain the sample, but it doesn't help necessarily solve the crime. So on that theme, if either you or Dr. Sampson could explain to the public uh, the, the standards and guidelines to ensure that when DNA evidence is collected, how is it stored, how is it used properly, and if you could bring us through the process from crime scene to courtroom that DNA evidence goes through. So it's collected at a crime scene and then sort of by the NYPD, it's given to OCME to process, whether it be a rape test kit or whether it be blood evidence that's found or all the things that uh, the NYPD described in their testimony. Can you bring us through the protocols that are used to ensure that it uh, remains uh, properly stored and safe from beginning when you receive it from the NYPD to when it gets to a courtroom. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Dr. Craig O'Connor, who is an assistant director in the forensic biology department. I think he can probably take you through that in more detail than I can. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Dr. Craig O'Connor, assistant director in the department of forensic biology. Uh, so basically when we receive the evidence from the NYPD, uh, it is received through our property control unit or evidence unit as we call it. So they will, uh, will receive that evidence and store it in a secure location until a criminalist at the forensic biology laboratory uh, takes it from them to do their examination of the evidence. So there's a control facility where only the uh, evidence unit has access to that evidence at the time and then the analysts will go get the evidence one piece at a time. Uh, once they get that evidence from the evidence unit, they will then bring it to their workstation where they will do their examination. Um, it's pre-sterilized. At that time, they will take that evidence, um, looking at the outer packaging, uh, looking for any identifying marks, uh, numbers, basically to make sure they have the correct item of evidence, comparing it to the NYC, NYPD voucher that it's uh, associated with and such. Uh, once they open up the evidence, again, they'll do a uh, cataloging of what's inside the packaging, take any photos if necessary, uh, again, any identifying marks, and then they'll begin their uh, visual examination of that item of evidence, uh, usually looking for the presence of any biological-looking material. So, for instance, if we're looking for blood, we'll look for a reddish-brown stain. Um, some preliminary screening tests may be done, and then if there are any samples that are taken, they're sent on for DNA testing. 
At that stage, uh, there are a number of steps to DNA testing. Uh, the first is the extraction step where we're getting the, cell, the DNA out of the cells. So whether we're talking skin cells, blood cells, uh, semen cells, uh, we will get the DNA out of those cells. And at, at this instance now, the samples are kept in a um, test tube, each individual test tube, and worked on one sample at a time. Once the samples are sent on for that preliminary step of DNA, the items of evidence are then repackaged and given back to the uh, property unit to store until all the testing is complete, and then it will be sent back to the NYPD. So once those samples go through that first extraction step, it then goes to a quantitation step where we find out how much DNA we have in the sample. Obviously, if we don't have enough or any, we can not continue on with our testing. Once the DNA samples are quantitated, uh, it then goes through a process that we call PCR amplification. So similar to a Xerox machine, we're making copies of the DNA at the locations that we uh, do our testing and do our analyzing on. After the samples are amplified, they're then separated out by size, and then the analysts will look at those samples, uh, interpret them, make their conclusions, and write a report. Uh, once the report is written summarizing their conclusions, it is technically reviewed by a senior analyst or a supervisor uh, before it is released out to the uh, district attorney's office or the U.S. attorney's office our, our usual, and the NYPD, our usual customers that we do release those um, reports out to. Are these protocols public? Yes, they are. They are on our public-facing website. So when we talk about databases, there's the CODIS database that Dr. Sampson just referred to, which is the database that is regulated or under the purview of state and federal regulations, which is why you said only under a court order can uh, someone be removed from that. But there's also the local database, which is different. So I guess the question I was asking before, or I was trying to ask before, is what goes into... Does everything go into both? The, um, we could talk into the mic. If everyone, everything, does everything go into the, both the local database and the CODIS database? It, it depends. Is the what, short does it answer, de what does it depend on? Right, go ahead. Yeah. Really, it depends <laughs> upon, uh, for the most part, the completeness of the profile and then where that evidence uh, sample was received from. As uh, Florence Huntner was saying, that if it is a sample that deems to be matching a victim or somebody else sent in for elimination purposes, then it will not be stored in any of the databases. It will just be used in that specific uh, case in order to compare to the evidence and see, again, if it matches or it does not match. If it is a qualifying um, type of sample, then it can go into the uh, local database only. Again, this has uh, profiles of known and unknown individuals trying to match up things locally. Uh, if it meets the requirements to go up into the state level, then it will be in the local and the state. And then if it meets the requirements for the national level, then it will go up into all three. So again, to go back to the question I asked Dr. Sampson before, if there is an individual who is trying to be excluded as a suspect and gives their uh, DNA, uh, they voluntarily give their DNA because they say, I have nothing to hide. I want to make sure that I'm not considered a suspect. Does that go into the local database? Yes. Yes. Yes, it does. And when they're excluded, does that come out of the local database? No, only under court order. I thought only CODIS was under court order. No, I mean, Eldis is part of CODIS. There is three levels to CODIS, the local database, the state database, and the national database. Okay. So we run ELDIS for the most part under the same general guidelines as CODIS. Does any entity outside of OCME dictate local database protocols? Uh, no, but we so you so So you could, if you wanted to, without court order, remove people who are not suspects anymore from the local database. That's up to you. You don't need a court order to do it. Our, uh, what I described is our practice is to do it under court uh, order. But you don't but have we, to. It, that's right. Correct. So then why are you not doing that? If someone is no longer deemed a suspect, why are you still requiring a court order? So the... Um, the Right. The, the first problem um, is that we don't find out 
when a person is no longer a suspect or when a case Why has not? been adjudicated. Because we are not, uh, um, we don't get that feedback from either the district attorney's office. Wouldn't that be very the, important feedback to get if you're storing people's personal DNA information that could be used against them, given the number of exonerations we've seen and wrong, wrongful convictions? How I, I fail to see how this DNA could be used uh, against them. I, would you clarify what you mean by that? If you're storing someone's DNA mm -hmm. because they were initially part of a potential crime and then they were excluded, and you're holding on to their DNA, and you continue to, when new crimes come up, to run through databases the evidence that you have, and you're keeping people that had done nothing wrong, have not been accused of anything, had not been convicted of anything, they're still staying in that database because they voluntarily gave their DNA to OCME. How is that fair? Because what is the, what is the public purpose? It would not purpose? come up again. It would never match against anything else unless it matched to another crime. But that other crime potentially is separate from why they initially came to you in the first that, place. I think that has to do uh, with the NYPD as they collect these samples. Okay, we can we can move on. So no outside entity, uh, no outside entity outside of OCME dictates lo dictates local database protocols. It's only OCME that dictates that. If anyone's, uh, if a, a suspect who uh, is in the database, if their attorney comes to us and asks us to, to expunge it, we will. But this is the way well, it runs so now. So I don't want to stereotype here or generalize, but a lot of people who end up in the criminal justice system are people who uh, may not be wealthy, uh, may not have attorneys that are versed in this in the way that they should. And so I don't understand why you will do that if someone asks in a proactive way but if for some reason someone doesn't act in a proactive way, they don't get the same benefit. Well, it's, it's because, the, uh, as the NYPD, I'm sure, would uh, be happy to explain, the local database is a very important tool that they use to solve um, other crimes that are uh, uh, associated. So. Well, I, think, I think it's important to, to talk about the success of the local database and the impact of the local database on the citizens of the city of New York. So I'd like to talk to you about a remarkable case that occurred on July 27, 2004. A 68-year-old woman was in her Brooklyn apartment when an unknown male knocked on the door. He asked to use her phone. She turned him away and locked the door. Seconds later, the male pushed in the door and grabbed the woman by the neck. He displayed a knife and instructed her not to scream. He then raped her and proceeded to rob her. The suspect left and the victim called for help. A male profile was developed from a rape kit and uploaded into CODIS. Nine years later, in 2013, the male profile matched to a second rape of a 26-year-old woman. The case continues to remain unsolved, and we have a serial rapist in the streets of the city of New York. 2014, a suspect exemplar was collected from an individual submitted for an unrelated incident to the OCME, his DNA matched both rapes. He was arrested for rape first degree, robbery first degree, robbery second degree, burglary second degree, and assault second degree. This had a significant impact, not only in solving this case, bringing closure to the victim and the victim's families for being a sexual assault victim, but moreover prevented this individual from committing additional rapes and more violent crimes in the city of New York. I'm really is a testament yes, to I'm, the immeasurable value of the local DNA index system. I'm really happy to hear that that case was solved and that we took a serial rapist and violent criminal off the streets of New York because I know that uh, District Attorney Vance, through his uh, settlement monies, was able to fund a rape test kit processing program nationally across the country. Uh, for us to do similar things, which is find serial rapists who are out there committing crimes across state lines uh, and getting people off the streets. So I, I, I'm really, it's helpful um, to hear that. Uh, and the, the hearing today is in no way to try to impede that. 
That is not what, that's not what my line of questioning is about. I'm trying to understand how we collect certain things, how we remove people that have in no way been suspects or convicted of anything in any way, because there is always this um, very important line between uh, ensuring that innocent people uh, do not get pulled into the criminal justice system uh, undeservedly so in an unwarranted way and maintaining a criminal justice system that is able to go after bad people who are committing violent crimes and lock them up so they cannot perpetrate violent acts against the public. And I think that is the very difficult question that we straddle, which is how do we ensure that people's constitutional rights are protected while at the same time allowing law enforcement to go out there and convict, apprehend, and bring to trial uh, people that are committing these crimes. So I, that's a very helpful example, and I'm glad uh, that you raised it. But I want to keep going down this line of questioning. So the, the, the local database, uh, are these guidelines public? The local database guidelines? My understanding is that the OCME has a manual that governs how and um, how we deal with all aspects of CODIS. Um, it is not to my knowledge at this time public, but this is something we can go back and look at. I don't have further information at this time. So the, the guidelines for the local database are not public? I don't believe so. Why, why not? At this time, Council Member, all I know is that as far as I know, they are not public. This is something we can go back and look at I, and get back to you. No, I don't want to. I mean, you, you all, this is a very, very important thing you all do on a daily basis. And there are uh, very significant things at stake here, again, to go back to ensuring public safety and uh, that we take violent people off the streets. Uh, but at the same time, given the questions that have come up, and I'm going to give it to my colleague in a second, I apologize for speaking so much. Um, you can't tell me you don't know why it's not public. There has to be a reason. You're the general counsel, you're the chief medical examiner. You have to have some explanation on why these guidelines aren't public. There has to be some thought behind why the guidelines aren't public. These are documents that can be foiled. So I don't know if anybody has made any requests under the Freedom of Information Law for them, but they are, you know, to the extent that they are agency policies, and they are final Any of the policies, advocates here they... tried to foil, you raise your hand, have any of the advocates here tried to foil these guidelines? Not to my knowledge. The FOIL requests come through my office. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, does the New York State Forensic Commission or its DNA subcommittee weigh in on the handling and the guidelines of the local database? I don't believe so. The, the CODIS is governed by the FBI and by FBI rules, and we follow those guidelines and the quality assurance standards that are set forth by the FBI. Uh, may I add also that the DNA subcommittee and the Forensic Science Commission are well aware of the local database and that uh, such local databases are uh, used uh, in many jurisdictions throughout the country. So the, just uh, uh, forgive me if I'm being a little dense and slow here. There's CODIS, which is governed by the FBI and federal law enforcement, correct? So let me, let me see if I can help here. CODIS is the combined DNA. Walk me through DNA database for dummies. Okay, I'm gonna do my best because that's, that's more or less the level where I am. I am, I am not a DNA scientist. Um, so uh, CODIS stands for the Combined DNA Database. It has different components. At the, at the local level, there are local DNA index systems. The eldest, which is our uh, local DNA database, which you have been referring to. Um, at the next level are state databases. You, people may have used the term ESTIS, SDIS is the acronym for the State DNA Index System. And at the top of this sort of pyramid, if you will, is the National DNA 
index system, the ENDIS. Um, and the FBI quality assurance standards govern all of those to the extent that for any local database to be eligible to provide <coughs> DNA profiles from evidence samples to higher levels within the CODIS system, they must abide by those and conform to those FBI quality assurance standards. Was, was the local database that was created, and I believe are there eight local labs that have local database? How many local databases are there in New York State? Do we know? I don't have the number offhand, dude. It eight? is eight. Okay, so there's eight. So the eight local databases that were created and exist in New York State, when on this uh, diagram right here, the linkage, there's no linkage detailed on how these things link together when it comes to the local database. And my understanding is that's because when the legislature authorized the creation of local databases, they in, indeed did not authorize OCME to maintain a database of unconvicted individuals. Were you ever, as general counsel, is your understanding of the legislative intent and the regulations behind a local database that you were ever authorized to collect and keep unconvicted individuals? My understanding is that there is no legislation or state or federal regulation barring that, that there is no, there is no. So you guys, it may not be barring it, but you guys are, Without guidance, you guys are interpreting it as to act that way without clear legislative intent or without clear regulations saying that you should interpret it that way. As far as I know, we have the authority to set up the database to the extent there are local databases, I believe, in the country that don't necessarily conform to the FBI quality assurance standards, and those are not part of CODIS. In order for our local database to be part of CODIS, we must comply with those quality assurance standards, and we do. Okay. Uh, so while DNA There is nothing prohibiting um, the storage of the profiles of unconvicted individuals. There's nothing prohibiting it, but is there anything authorizing it, explicitly there is authorizing nothing, it? There is nothing explicitly. So it's a gray area, and you guys are interpreting it a certain do. way, and the legal community, uh, I think, has some concerns about that. I understand that there are members of the legal community who have concerns about this database, but it's my position as general counsel for this agency that what we do is fully authorized by law. So, you know, the Innocence Project is probably the most well-known, and they're going to testify today, but they're probably the most well-known organization that has been successful in exonerating individuals who were wrongly convicted, spent a significant amount of time, uh, cracked old cold cases uh, when uh, attorneys had abandoned certain clients who had been uh, incarcerated for long periods of time, many of them poor individuals, uh, individuals uh, of color uh, who could not afford significant legal representation and were able to make their case to have the Innocence Project come in and take a look at their case, go back, look at DNA uh, evidence and information, and to try to understand if these folks were wrongfully convicted. They're one of the folks that I think are going to testify today that they have an issue with this. I'm not going to speak for them, but the, we're not talking about some crackerjack organizations that are out there saying crazy things. We're talking about organizations that have spent decades trying to ensure that people are not wrongfully convicted, imprisoned, and lose their liberty as citizens of the United States based off of uh, some issues in our criminal justice system that may not ensure that these citizens have been uh, fully given the constitutional protections that they're needed. And it would be helpful if, if uh, the OCME staff, uh, Dr. Sampson, including you, uh, and the NYPD, would stay today to hear their 
to hear their testimony because I think they're going to go, you may know it already, but I think they're going to go into detail about some of the real concerns they have around this. They're a lot more fluent in these issues because they deal with them on a daily basis. And I may not be the best person to be asking these questions because I'm not a lawyer. I'm not someone that specializes in criminal defense law or in the issues that you will have to grapple with every single day. And again, I want to go back to the, the statement I made to uh, the, the, the fine member of the NYPD that's here. Uh, that, you know, these are difficult issues that we grapple with, but it would be helpful if you could hear their concerns today. I appreciate that. There are a couple of things that I want to clarify, Council Member. One is that without these databases, some of those exonerations could not have taken place, that the, that the DNA profiles um, and the DNA analysis that the OCME has done have contributed to a number of exonerations, and Dr. Sampson described just one of those as an example in her testimony. The other thing that I want to make sure is clear is that um, we were talking about statutes and regulations a moment ago, but I do want to clarify that there are a number of New York State Supreme Court decisions that uphold the authority of the um, OCME to maintain its local database in the way that it does. And if that information is something that would be helpful to you or your counsel, I would be happy to provide Thank it. Thank you. I want to, I want to uh, move on quickly because uh, I know Councilman Williams is here and he has a bill that needs to be heard today. Uh, and the NYPD uh, gave some testimony in that bill, but I'm sure he has questions for the NYPD about their testimony. And I want to be uh, mindful of his time. Uh, but I want to move on to high sensitivity testing and forensic statistical tool uh, issues. So while DNA analysis of single source and sample mixture samples is well established, as I said in my opening statement, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology found that more research was required to establish the foundational validity of DNA analysis of complex mixtures. Does OCME dispute this finding with regards to the forensic statistical tool or the star mix? Do you dispute PCAST's finding that more research was required to establish the foundational validity of DNA analysis of complex mixtures? Well, when it comes to looking at both of those types of situations, both the analysis of complex mixtures uh, whether it's using the FST or star mix or uh, with lower copies of DNA LCN, um, we do agree that research needs to be done and it needs to be properly validated. And these are the two things that OCME has done. We have properly validated both techniques uh, thoroughly. Both of these techniques, the LCN testing and the FST, uh, were validated over a course of multiple years before they're ever put online. Uh, they're also um, subject FST to, has been abandoned. It has not been abandoned. We are still using it today on older cases. So if there was a new case start in 2017 uh, that was processed in the laboratory, then we would be using StarMix because StarMix was validated on the newer DNA typing kit that we began using this year. So you feel more confident about StarMix than you do about FST? Absolutely not. The thing is that we would have had to validate FST on the newer kit to be used starting this year. Um, but since we had validated and developed FST back in 2010 and 11, uh, more kits have come online, programs have come online that were uh, commercially available. So just I wanna, I wanna say this uh, again. PCAST has said that they do not fully agree that there is foundational validity to the methods we're talking about, FST and StarMix. Do you, do you agree with that, that, they're not, that they're not saying that? They, they, they still PCAST have questions? PCAST said that? Yes. Yeah, but there's numerous problems with the PCAST report, and I'd like to have an opportunity to address Go those. Ahead. Um, PCAST is widely criticized by scientists as politically motivated and scientifically unsound, and its report has generally been discredited. There are many shortcomings in the PCAST report, including its failure to reflect the view of the forensic science community, and, they, uh, and, and as evidenced by this lengthy open letter by Dr. Bruce Budewold, 
uh, an expert who frequently testifies on behalf of criminal defendants. And he not only notes the absence from the PCAS report of any data or other indication that PCAS reviewed or tested any probabilistic genotyping programs, that's what uh, FST is, um, but he lists multiple other inadequacies as well. And he wrote that the PCAS report, it was so obvious that the report was not particularly helpful from a scientific, scientific perspective, as it was myopic, full of error, and did not provide data to support its contentions. A more significant concern regarding the failings of the PCAST report was that it claimed its focus was science, but obviously was de dedicated to policy. Initially, he considered writing a critique about the failures of this report to assist the community, but the problems with this report were so obvious that he did not think it necessary to devote time to such an effort. So I think- This is, this is, a, this is a scientist? This is a scientist. One scientist? This, yeah. Well, he's the former head of the DNA, uh, the FBI's DNA laboratory for over 30 years. He now heads up uh, a laboratory at the University of North Texas. But his sentiments have been echoed by many scientists throughout the community, including the American Academy of Forensic Science, uh, to name a few, uh, that do govern a lot of the work that we do in our uh, daily work. And I also want to point out at this point that uh, the science is either good or you think it's not good, you think it's bad. But defense attorneys, including those from the, some from the Legal Aid Society, have specifically asked OCME to run both LCN and FST in particular cases. So if the science is no good, I don't understand why they ask for that. Would you be open to reviewing cases in which low copy testing was done on very small mixtures? Did you understand the question? Understand the question. We, don't, we don't understand the question. Would you be open to reviewing cases in which low copy number testing was done on very small mixtures, where you feel, you feel totally confident and certain about all of the methods and science that's been used on every case that's come through your lab? We are totally confident. Okay. The New York Times article, Traces of DNA, stated in regard to forensic statistical tool, quote, the software's inventors acknowledge a margin of error of 30% in their method of qu uh, quantifying the amount of DNA in a sample, a key input into the FST calculation. They acknowledge that FST didn't consider that different people in a mixture, especially family members, might share DNA. Yet you stand by this methodology. Yes. Yes, we stand by okay. the methodology. How many cases, in how many cases was high sensitivity testing used on samples of less than 25 picograms containing mixtures of two or more individuals? Is that, is that often, is it not often? Does it happen, is it rare? I would, it's certainly not often, it might even be rare. Any, any numbers from anybody? No. Really numbers. Low numbers. Low numbers, okay. I would just add, though, for the quantitation system that I mentioned, the 30 percent, that's a little bit of misleading because the quantitation at the time uh, was the gold standard for the community and what was available to us. And there was, again, hundreds of samples that were done and years of validation that was done to show that that quantitation uh, value-based system was adequate and uh, a reasonable estimate for what we are doing. I also want to offer uh, to you, uh, uh, Councilman Johnson, at this point, uh, for the, um, uh, our response to the uh, IG, uh, the, the complaint to the IG's office. We have an extensive written response uh, that exhaustively talks about all the points that you raised in your opening statement, and we would be glad to share that with you. That would be very helpful. I appreciate that, Dr. Sampson. Uh, and again, this is not personal. I think you guys have, have done a great job. But I think it's important to ask these questions, uh, given that there is concern around this. I'm not an expert, and so I don't ask these questions with any real bias. I'm, I'm going to ask hard questions to the other folks that come up here as well uh, to try to understand this and help the public understand these complex, complicated scientific issues in a broader way. Uh, so I just want to be clear. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going after you. I'm. I'm just trying to get answers to things that have been questioned. There have been news reports, and there are real concerns. So, um, I know the PCAST report talked about many, many, many things, 
And I know that you just, of course, read a quotation and some testimony from the uh, scientist who was explaining to me as the former head of the FBI's lab for many decades. Were there things in that report that you that, that you remember that you do think were valid? I'm not talking about as it relates to FST or, or low copy. I'm just talking about generally, did you think that it was a, sort of just a blatantly political report or there were some scientifically helpful valid things that actually existed in that report? Oh, I mean, of course there were scientifically valid things. Like we had said before, it, it says that these methods should be based on solid science foundation with the research and validation that's needed uh, to prove their efficacy and use in, in casework samples. So uh, we wholeheartedly agree with that, and that's why before any technique is put online for casework, we do go through that research and validation process, not only internally, but looking at what others throughout the community are doing and leaning on some of those uh, lessons learned as we go through our own validation process. Along with that, we do have the Forensic Science Commission of the State of New York, which has its uh, DNA subcommittee made up of experts within the DNA community that is responsible for reviewing these new techniques. So it's not like we're just putting these out on casework with no oversight. We have to go through these steps following validation guidelines put out by the FBI uh, their scientific working group on DNA analysis methods. We're also following the FBI's quality assurance standards and then going through the process of uh, bringing these in front of the Forensic Science Commission and DNA Subcommittee for approval. So we do agree with those sentiments that are put into the PCAS report. That's oh, helpful. Yeah. That's helpful to have that context to understand kind of what you all thought was valid and, and re was resonant with the work that you do on a daily basis and the issues uh, that you had concerns about. I have a question for the NYPD. Uh, the PCAST report concluded that bite mark analysis and footwear analysis are not scientifically valid methodologies. Does the NYPD continue to use bite mark analysis and footwear analysis when it's conducting investigations? So bite mark analysis is not conducted by the NYPD. Footwear impression examinations are a service that we provide in the NYPD. As far as the... Uh, you guys don't do anything related to bite marks? We do not. Okay. That's helpful to hear. I didn't know that. Okay. Other than potentially collecting probative DNA evidence from a bite mark yes, on yes. a victim. Okay. And then... Uh, The PCAS report also uh, recommended converting latent fingerprint analysis that you had mentioned in your testimony from a subjective method to an objective method using automated image analysis. Is, is the NYPD or OCME considering doing that, moving from the subjective method to the objective method by using that automated uh, image analysis? The, the assertion that uh, our method is subjective is uh erroneous and without merit. Uh, our approach is what we call the ACE-V method, which is the accepted method in the forensic fingerprint comparison community that has been around for dec decades and is accepted in the courts of law. So you, this you, method provides us with the ability to objectively examine fingerprints. You, so you disagree with the PCAST and them saying that? Well, they're saying you're not object. You're, they're they're uh, contending that it's subjective. You're saying it's not. You're saying it is already objective. Precisely. Great. I think that's all the questions uh, that I have. Um, I appreciate your testimony, uh, and I look forward to continuing to have a conversation about this. And I appreciate the really hard work you all do on a daily basis and keeping our city safe in a fulsome way with the criminal justice community, law enforcement, scientists, the district attorneys, and the other folks that work to keep our city safe. At the same time, I want to ensure that New Yorkers' constitutional uh, liberties, rights, and protections are afforded to them in uh, the best way possible, and that's always the balance we have to look at here. So I want to turn it over to uh, my co-chair, uh, Councilmember Gibson. Thank you very much, Chair Johnson. I don't know that there's anything left to ask to this afternoon. <laughs> 
but uh, I'll always find something. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, additional colleagues who are here, Councilmember Robert Cornegie, Councilmember Jamani Williams, Councilmember Haim Deutsch, Councilmember Inez Barron, and Councilmember Rosie Mendez. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us. And certainly before I ask any questions, I just want to join uh, Chair Johnson in commending uh, both the NYPD as well as OCME for the stellar work that you have done. Uh, the fact that we have so many New Yorkers in this state that have been exonerated for many different infractions of uh, misidentification, of witness tampering, and other issues, the fact that we have made such incredible advancements in science and technology and DNA, many of those individuals are free today. So I want to thank you. Um, as chair of this committee, I've worked very closely with Innocence Project and many others that represent many of our um, New Yorkers who have been exonerated. I hate to categorize them, but it's a very unique but important population that has a real powerful testimony. But I truly know that because of DNA evidence, many, um, majority of them are free. So I want to thank you. Um, this is the first time this committee has really talked about DNA and forensic evidence and the practices and procedures and guidelines and all of the different measures that um, both of your offices undertake. So I appreciate appreciate the testimony and all of the work that you and your staffs do um, while you're here. Certainly all of the scientists and all of the civilian staff, both at the NYPD and OCME, do every, every day really does make a difference. Uh, when I heard the numbers of 155,000 uh, cases and tests, I mean, that's a lot of work. So uh, definitely today's hearing is really an opportunity to further understand the work you're doing. Uh, you talked about some of the staffing issues, the Healing NYC initiative that we embarked on that really provides more critical staff that's needed for technology and for training and investigations. And certainly, moving forward for January, um, know that we are going to remain partners in this work as we continue to advance technology, as we continue to deal with the opioid and the fentanyl uh, crisis that we're going through. And I say that personally because there is a high uh, concentration in Bronx County and Richmond County. So I take this obviously deeply personal to make sure that we can do everything possible to avoid uh, overdose deaths. Um, and working with Bridget Brennan, the special narcotics prosecutor, and others, we've been able to save countless lives with uh, naloxone and, and other measures. So I am grateful for that, and I'm grateful for your work. I just wanted to make sure that's clarified, because I know while we talk about some of the challenges that we may face, I don't want to overstate enough the work that is done and the fact that we are here to talk about all of the successes, all of the incredible work we've done, you know, giving victims an opportunity to provide not only justice, but a second chance at life. So so that that crime does not have to overpower them and take over their lives is really impactful. So I really want to give all of you credit where credit is due. Um, I wanted to just ask a, a couple of questions specific to the local database, as, as Chair Johnson alluded to. And you talked about some of the different uh, stakeholders, the district attorneys, prosecutors, and others that have access to the database. I wanted to understand the in terms of court order, sorry, let me okay. clarify that. Uh, I wanted to understand the interplay and the coordination, that may not be the right word, but what is happening with federal and FBI oversight in terms of having access to the database? Do you get, how does it work in terms of getting any inquiries in accessing DNA and the profile? Does the FBI have access to the local database? Generally speaking? Uh, no, they do not. Okay. So I, I, it's an excellent question. Obviously, this database is very carefully regulated. Right. Um, both by uh, the FBI and then our uh, locally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a CODIS group that consists of about four scientists and then about another 100 scientists who go through FBI clearance to be able to interact with okay. the CODIS system. So okay. the NYPD has no direct access uh, to the CODIS system. And the information in CODIS are, is DNA profiles. So mm -hmm. it, it, there's no um, 
uh, uh, personal identifiers in there. So you right. can't just go in and say, you know, let me see Barbara Sampson's uh, right. DNA. Right. So it is a very well uh, protected system. Anything you want to add, Greg, Craig, on that? Uh, really, the FBI controls the computer system. So uh, okay. that, the, the, computer yeah, the computer software mm -hmm. that will connect uh, and you know, do the matches and the hits. So if there's a hit national, nationally, they may coordinate the states to get that information, but at the state level, it's the state DNA index system that's run okay. by the state lab up in Albany that would coordinate state hits, and then obviously we would coordinate the local hits. So okay. as far as uh, access and database, like Dr. Sampson says, uh, there are no identifying names in there at all. It's just the profile, right, and the FBI does not have access okay. to our local and database. no demographic information of any right. sort either. So when you say hits, is that equivalent to inquiries? A hit is equivalent to a match. So if a there's match. a potential okay. match between uh, one item of evidence that had a profile to another profile, whether it be another unknown item or from a known individual, that's a, a what we call a hit or a potential match that would then lead to some further investigation. Okay. So in, in terms of any time frame, I mean, you, uh, Chief, talked about a case, obviously, that was incredibly important where the DNA profile was, you know, there was a hit on that profile almost nine years after that first crime, and you were able to solve a second crime. So that's very valuable, and I want people to understand that, you know, sometimes you know, you have habitual offenders that don't commit a crime the next day, the next month, but there is some time that does passes, that, that does pass. Um, what I wanted to understand was the, the DNA sample itself and the comparison to the actual profile. So the profile itself that's in CODIS is a part of the computer software. But what happens to the actual DNA sample that you talked about where it goes through a series of a process? And I, I have friends who are, you know, Scientologists and criminologists, and they try to explain this, and it's really like in another language in terms of how you test it. It has different samples, and it goes through different measures before you can say with, you know, confidence, this is the DNA match to someone. So that DNA sample itself how is that stored and how long is that stored and what happens over time? Because I can imagine there is some compromise as time passes with that DNA sample. Well, once we process the sample and we get a profile, okay, that's basically it for that sample. We don't need to go back. We don't need to re rely upon that actual okay. piece of evidence. So we, it's discarded? So it, most of the evidence we get uh, are items so whether it's a shirt oh, okay. or uh, you know clothing mm -hmm. a weapon like a baseball bat or something to that effect or we'll get uh, what we call swabs so imagine a right. q-tip that's used to try and collect up the dna or the biological material so we'll take a portion of that or sometimes if it's a very small sample we may consume it but if it's just a portion we'll test that portion and then the rest of it gets sent back to the property clerk nypd so the okay. sample itself does not stay with us in most cases. Does that also include blood as well? In terms of, because you, you describe different uh, items, tooth you know, toothbrush and stuff like that. What about bodily fluids? Is that? We'll get uh, items of evidence that will have bodily fluids on them. Okay, And I see. then we'll do that. And then obviously we'll get... Uh, for elimination purposes, a sample uh, from autopsy, a blood sample, which will, again, take a very small portion, get the DNA profile, and then send that back to the uh, ME's office for that one. But okay. um, once we get that DNA profile, which, again, is just a string of numbers that represents the person's DNA at the location that we're testing, once we get a, that profile, that's what's stored in the databases if it's eligible and the items of evidence uh, will be sent back. Okay. Uh, defense attorneys, what access do they have to, if they're defending a client and their client's DNA is collected and there is um, a, a CODIS profile on that particular person, does a defense attorney have to also go through the route of a court order to obtain any evidence to def defend their client? How does that work? I'm not sure what you're asking for, as far as that. You talked about prosecutors, district attorneys, being able to access information through a court order. Is that also applicable to defense attorneys that are defending their clients? Yeah. 
Does that make sense? So if I understand your, your question, Council Member, I think the answer is that um, defense attorneys do have access to the case files. Um, under the, there is, a, there is a, a slight wrinkle with that. Under the city charter, uh, we need the approval of the district attorney to turn over uh, any, any okay, material that relates to homicide cases, but that applies to family members as well. I mean, that's just across the board. So as a general, and usually they, in, if there is a homicide matter, um, my understanding is that the, the district, the prosecutor will provide the information to the defense. So the, I think fundamentally that was a very long way of saying essentially yes. Okay, okay. But so you need the district attorney to be on board. What happens if the district Only attorney... Only in the case of a homicide. Oh, okay. Okay. And it is, you know, if, if the defense attorney in question is, to, you know, is, is representing the defendant in the homicide case, I assume that all of the criminal procedure rules that apply would ensure that the, the defense gets what it needs at some point, but we don't have as much control over that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. I understand. Um, I had a few questions about just specific forensic analyses, which is hard to understand as a layperson. So I want to ask a question about fingerprints and how that works in terms of the methodology and the process that the crime lab uses on analyzing fingerprints. How does that work? That's somewhat of an open-ended question. Is there, is there a specific hypothetical example you'd like to use, or do you want me to just take it from a crime scene? And, if you and, could take uh, it from a crime scene, and in terms of what your standard is, in terms of the threshold that you have to use to analyze fingerprints, like what is your threshold, what is some of the criteria that the crime lab has to use right. as it relates to fingerprints? So fingerprint evidence is, mm -hmm. is collected fundamentally in two different ways. Okay. Uh, Looking at a crime scene, we will process surfaces and areas for the presence of latent fingerprints. Okay. And consequently, we will go ahead and collect those fingerprints via a lifting method. So we call you said them lifting? Lifting. Okay, There's, lifting. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's it. a lift. Uh, we use a piece of what we call lift tape, which secures the evidence. Oh, okay. And we subsequently package those lifts and submit those lifts for examination. So that, that's one way okay. that fingerprints are collected from the crime scene. Uh, a second way is when the actual what I'll call substrate or standard item, for example, this glass case, may have fingerprints that may aid in the criminal investigation. It would be collected by a member of the NYPD's crime scene unit or evidence collection teams or a detective and forwarded to the laboratory for processing. So this particular glass case would be packaged properly documentation would be prepared and subsequently this evidence item would be forwarded to the laboratory. In the laboratory we have a unit called the latent print development unit which I talked about in my testimony and they will go ahead and employ laboratory techniques to develop fingerprints on the surface of this glass case. In the event there is a fingerprint that is developed based on the methods and techniques that we employ we will take a high resolution digital image with a digital camera okay. of that fingerprint that is developed and electronically forward that fingerprint to a separate unit which is outside of the laboratory under our okay. division called the latent print section. That image will be examined by latent print examiners and they will, based on the first step, assess whether or not that print is what we call of value or no value. A value essentially means that there is enough friction ridge information to move forward to perform a comparison with that fingerprint that was developed. Is there a value, is there a number you have to achieve to get? So it, out of a given you know, one to 10 ratio, is there a value that you have to meet as a threshold for that, that particular sample to be deemed valid? No, this is okay. based on the subject matter expertise of latent print examiners. Okay. We, we do not use a quantitative method to count the amount okay. of friction ridge detail. Okay. Uh, it's, it's simply not uh, accomplished in that manner. Uh, many years ago, there was a point method that was generally accepted in the community. 
uh, we don't look simply at uh, points. We look at the totality of the forensic evidence and the print evidence, the friction reach detail, and the knowledge that we have of performing comparisons and the friction ridge evidence. So taking it from that point, we would move forward and we would either use a database to search that fingerprint, seeking candidates, or we would do direct comparisons, similar to DNA evidence. Those comparisons could be to suspects that are developed through the criminal investigation by detectives in the field, mm -hmm. or we would compare them to individuals that we know had legitimate access or victims because we want to exclude them as being the individuals that left their fingerprints at a crime scene. So all of this is the holistic approach to the forensic investigation via fingerprints. Okay. At that point, in the event a conclusion is drawn, so we draw conclusions which are identifications to a known person, we draw exclusions to known persons, and then the third type is what we call inconclusive. Inconclusive, okay. <laughs> And what's on average a typical time frame? So this is just one part of an overall investigation using uh, this particular analysis of fingerprints. So what you just, just described is very detailed, very tedious, um, but necessary. So what's an average time frame that you know, one of your analysts would have to go through just to determine if that fingerprint that they obtained is of useful value for that particular crime? So I do want to apologize because it's a very complicated system. I know it so sounds so it. large. Um, so it depends. So okay. it depends. So for example, the glass case that requires latent print development work up front, it depends on the number of prints that are developed. It depends on the techniques. We have dye staining techniques that we use. Uh, some of the techniques actually take two days in the laboratory to let the chemical reagents dry and for the examiner to evaluate the results of the chemical enhancement. Uh, other uh, types of evidence that I talked to you about, as far as lifts, lifts are readily available to examine immediately. So when those lifts are collected, the appropriate documentation accompanies those lifts to the latent print section, and in general, based on uh, our routine system, analysis and examinations will begin within two days. So if it's a lift, it's in general two days. If it's something that's sent to the laboratory, it may be double or triple the amount. Bearing in mind that when we look at forensic cases, um, they vary. So a case that has 18 fingerprints is going to take a lot more time right, of than a case with a single fingerprint. And very similar to DNA. So the more comparisons that are conducted, the more evidence that is developed and acquired, uh, the turnaround time to report results to our customers, being either the detectives that are investigating or prosecutors in an arrest case, uh, depends on the amount of evidence, the complexity of the evidence, and the type of evidence. Okay. You can tell I probably watch Law & Order quite a bit, so <laughs> th this is really interesting for me. So now that I have asked you about fingerprints, I want to understand the process for analyzing footwear. Right, and, and how does that work? Because again, construction wear, sandals, I mean, everything has some level of evidence that you could ex extract that would be helpful in, in solving these crimes. So can you tell me like the process and what, what you do in, in terms of extracting any evidence from footwear? Sure, so, so it's important to, to kind of start this conversation off with the frequency of footwear evidence being collected out of crime okay. scenes. And let me tell you it's infrequent. Uh, infrequent? Infrequent. Of footwear? Footwear impression evidence. Oh, okay. So uh, based on the nature of the city that uh, the vast majority of the geography of New York City is concrete and structural, um, okay. quite often we do challenge. not recover fingerprint, uh, excuse me, footwear impressions at crime scenes. However, if there is a probative footwear impression that is a, a crime scene, uh, crime scene investigators are trained to competency to go ahead and employ collection techniques and methods to acquire that footwear impression evidence. And it begins with uh, photography, so very sophisticated uh, photographs and enhanced photographs are taken at the crime scene, and then depel depending on the type of footwear impression. So you could have a footwear impression that is in dirt or mud, you could have a footwear impression uh, which we call a three-dimensional footwear impression. You could have a two-dimensional footwear impression on a ceramic tile or another surface. Uh, we would go ahead and employ the technique which is appropriate based on the evidence and based on 
the environment that that footwear impression is present. Once the evidence is collected, it is forwarded to the laboratory, and in the laboratory's criminalistic section, we have examiners that will begin to examine a footwear impression collected by the crime scene unit. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the analysis of firearm and, bu and ballistics. That's my third one. Um, and you talked a little bit about, you know, just the serial numbers on uh, guns that could be compromised in some way. You talked about the different techniques that are used to make sure that you can still extract that serial number um, in terms of bullet-resistant garment tests, firearm trigger pull tests, firearm drop tests. And there was something that you mentioned that I had a question on. Um, how often do you find in the cases that you see where in ballistics analyses, um, the serial number is compromised in some way? Like, is that something that happens with frequency or is that infrequent that you see? It, it, it is common. We, we, okay. we, we see serial numbers that are defaced uh, where individuals attempt to either drill out, scrape out, carve out the serial number on a firearm. Got it. Okay. Um, I wanted to understand how many bull ballistics tests on average do you guys conduct at the NYPD? Do you have a number on how many tests you conduct every year? Sure. You, so you're you gave me the, the number of cases that you look at, but just in terms of ballistics, what, do you have a number for that? I do. So, okay. so just so I understand your question. Uh, so the number of examinations, which is the totality of all examinations that are provided by the firearms analysis section Correct. of the laboratory. Yes. Sure, I, I have that for you. So it's upwards of 10,000. Uh, my apologies, I don't have a precise number, but it's upwards uh, okay. about 10,000 examinations each year. Okay, that's, that's a lot. Um, okay, and in terms of the examiners that you have in the unit that deals with firearms and ballistics, um, what types of, well, not just the basic training that they get, but in terms of understanding enhanced technology, technology measures and other things that could be used to further determine um, an analysis that involves a firearm or ballistics, how does that work? So how often are your examiners able to look at technology to see a, a new measure, a new upgrade that they could use that would allow them to better do their, their jobs? Right, so, so, so overall, we are actively engaged in the forensic community. And what that means is we are continually attending uh, national, international conferences right. as to That's where the pulse of the forensic community is, new technologies that become available. available. We also uh, communicate constantly, meet constantly with our partners in other agencies, uh, including the OCME. Uh, quite often we're taking trips to Philadelphia, uh, in other states. Uh, recently, it was in the New Jersey State Police talking with some of their folks in their forensic laboratory and their crime scene unit. So there's this ongoing effort to always learn more about new technologies and make certain that we're exploiting those technologies to keep the public safe. Okay, that's great. Um, and, and I agree, and I, I figured that was the answer. I just wanted to make sure. Um, I know the department has an incredible amount of relationships with other localities as well as us being just a national model um, and, and always looking at ways that we can be more efficient and, and traveling to do so, looking at other uh, localities and what they're doing. So that makes sense to me. Um, I wanted to ask you to expand a little bit on trace evidence because you talked about the laboratory's criminal, criminalistic section. What do they do? The criminalistic section is a section, and under that section, you have a host of what we call subdisciplines. So subdisciplines. Subdisciplines. So the discipline of Another criminalistics <laughs> is similar to the discipline of DNA evidence testing okay. or firearms examinations. We've kind of grouped all of these smaller disciplines together, and we call those disciplines subdisciplines under the criminalistic section.
How many do you have? Quite a few. Oh, goodness. Okay. Quite a few sub disciplines? Yes. So most of them I've mentioned to you. The primary is okay. the latent print development unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have, as I mentioned, the um, trace evidence collection unit, the okay. question document unit, which works with documents and letters and, and evidence that's in writing. Yeah. We okay. also have our gunshot residue muzzle to target distance determination yeah. unit. Okay. Um, some of these units, as I talk about them, get smaller and smaller as far as the number of individuals that are trained to competency to do casework and the number of evidence samples that are submitted. So we have a fire debris unit, we okay. have a paint examination unit, we have a, uh, individuals trained in something called general unknowns, we do uh, glass analysis, we do plastic bag analysis, we do explosives analysis, we do what we call jigsaw fit or physical fit analysis, tape analysis, et cetera. Wow. What's the, what's the discipline that focuses on other weapons that are not guns, like knives and other measures? What discipline is that that looks at in terms of uh, there's a stabbing, uh, there was a knife used? Like what part of this division analyzes uh, that evidence? We look at the probative forensic evidence that may be on the weapon. So, for example, we would look at a knife, in your hypothetical example, for the presence of fingerprints. Okay. That may be the perpetrators for the presence of blood. Blood, There may right. be some potential trace evidence. Hair. We may look at hair, precisely. So we'll, we'll collect this item of evidence, and that item of evidence will come to our laboratory, and our examiners will look at this evidence using a variety of methods. So obvious, obviously, optical magnification, looking under uh, microscopes in certain instances and other instances using alternate light sources at different frequencies. The, the objective is to identify evidence that is on that knife. Again, that'll further the investigation and help us get to the truth. So quite often there's physical evidence that's present that is not visible by the naked eye. So we have techniques, we have equipment, we have methods that we employ to find that evidence and see that evidence, despite the fact that it's not visible to us with our eye. Okay. And after NYPD finishes that part of the examination, mm -hmm. and if there's a stabbing fatality, uh, often uh, the medical examiner will look at the knife, for example, and uh, make an opinion as to whether that knife could possibly have caused the wound um, that was uh, seen on the body. Okay, uh, wow. Yeah. Um, I had a, a, an incident yesterday in the Bronx. There was a stabbing in my district that I'm sure that you guys now have in Highbridge in the 4-4. There was a gentleman who was uh, stabbed several times, but he survived, and, and thank God, uh, it looks like he will make a full recovery. So that's just one example, but I know this happens, uh, unfortunately, more often than not. So I wanted to understand, you know, just in terms of not gunshots, but... Um, knife wounds as well and how both of your offices work together in terms of looking at that weapon and, and collecting evidence and putting it all together. Uh, one thing that you may not realize about the medical examiner's office is that on occasion we are asked by the district attorney's office to examine living victims uh, for analysis of their wounds. For example, is this knife possibly caused this wound, um, range of fire in uh, okay. uh, shooting? So we do a lot of other things besides uh, autopsies. Right. So besides the work that you do at the, the crime lab at the OCME's office, do you often have to send staff out? So in, in my case yesterday, the young man is still in the hospital. So do you have to go to various, not just the crime scene itself, but other parts of that individual, that victim, um, where their last you know, visits were, where they um, visited, and as well as like hospital visits? Do you have to do that as well? Um, on, on occasion, the district attorney will ask us to uh, see a living victim in the hospital to make exactly that kind of analysis, or if okay. someone is still alive but likely to die, and they may have spent several weeks in the hospital, and during those several weeks, some of the uh, information from uh, the initial um, attack might disappear. We're often asked to go in. We send medical examiner staff physicians to examine the patient and also photographers uh, to document uh, that. So when the case does go to trial, uh, we can offer that uh, as well and our opinions as well at trial. 
Okay, understand. Um, I guess my final questions, I just wanted to talk about, uh, I'm a member of the finance committee, so I always have my finance hat on. Um, everything we do has a cost, and I know through Healing NYC, when we announced that uh, earlier this year, there was uh, re resources given to the NYPD as it relates to more staffing. So you talked about it a little bit in your testimony, so I wanted to make sure in terms of staffing, what the staff look like in terms of detectives, civilians, criminologists. I mean, what does your staff look like, and have we been able to fulfill all of those positions today? Sorry. So as far as our total staff in the laboratory, we have 376 individuals that mm -hmm. consist of both uniformed members of the service and civilian members Brilliant. of the service. Got it. Of the 376, we have 120 uniform, 256 civilians. And when to, to drill down on the, on the healing initiative of the mayor, right. we uh, recently increased our controlled substance analysis section by approximately 50 individuals. Uh, we've created a new tour. So this, given the fact that we don't have enough space We've started a four to 12 shift in order to ramp up and up staff to provide this service to the public. We have 43 individuals that are currently in training. So as you're aware, in order to do casework, in order for us to authorize you to do casework, you must prove that you are competent to do the work, not only physically, but you also have the cognitive skills to demonstrate and understand precisely what it is that you're doing and also prove to us that you come up with the correct answer and the most accurate result based on our standards and methods. So therefore, in order for us to begin to use these new individuals, they will not be available until March or April. So they're currently in training. Their okay. training program takes seven months due to the complexity of the work that they do and the chemical analysis they do. We anticipate that they will be available to start casework at the end of March, early April. Okay, so the controlled substance analysis team that you're talking about, are they specifically assigned to deal with the opioid and fentanyl, or would their responsibilities delve over the entire department? So specifically for Healing NYC, there was a focus, and there was an urgent need to hire and staff up to really focus on a targeted need, and that need is ongoing. So as the civilians are in the academy, so to speak, in their training, um, will they be assigned to deal with this, or will their responsibilities uh, span over more than just opioid and fentanyl, et cetera? So... Every day we receive hundreds, if not in certain instances, thousands of items of alleged controlled substances for us to test. Okay. Uh, not only do we need to test this evidence, but we also need to provide a report based on the speedy trial requirements within a timely manner to a prosecutor. So those results could either be the identification of a controlled substance and in certain instances the fact that there is not a controlled substance present where we generate exculpatory evidence. And we do this every day. So these individuals that are in training that I mentioned uh, coming in April, they'll be available to do casework, will be working on non-opioid cases. And the reason for that is that we have come to understand through our examinations of opioid cases and fentanyl cases that they are much more complicated to analyze, interpretation-wise, reporting, and investigating the evidence. So taking that into consideration, we uh, anticipate and plan on having the opioid evidence tested by our more senior examiners in the controlled substance analysis section. Okay. Um, as I turn this over to my colleagues, I guess the, the final thing I'll say is this is a lot to understand and absorb. Um, I, I will keep my day job. <laughs> this is a lot, um, but I give you a lot of credit for the work that you and your teams really do on this every single day. It is a lot to understand and absorb. Um, I guess my final question to both OCME and the NYPD is understanding some of the nuances we have with technological advances, some of the challenges we face, um, 
what do you see are your biggest challenges in the industry and where can we as a city council be helpful? Um, you know, Chair Johnson alluded to the local database and obviously I share a lot of those concerns. While we are doing great and incredible life-saving work, you know, I do recognize that there are challenges that we do face as an industry. And so certainly we want to understand some of our lessons that we're learning. We want to understand what we can do to be more efficient. Um, and so I'm asking, you know, from both of your perspectives, what are the challenges that you see that your agencies are facing today as it relates to forensic evidence and crime analysis and, and making sure that we solve crimes faster more efficient, and where can we as a council be helpful in moving this forward? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest challenge, I think, facing the medical examiner's office uh, is not so much in the laboratory end of things. We are getting uh, wonderful support uh, from the city uh, to hire uh, what we need to do both healing NYC initiatives uh, and our uh, DNA uh, mandates as well. Um, but uh, as Council Member Johnson asked me la uh, last time, the biggest challenge to all medical examiner's offices throughout the country, particularly with the huge huge increase in the opioid crisis nationwide is the lack of medical examiners. So the medical examiners are the people who do the autopsies, uh, determine cause and manner of death, determine if a case is a homicide, and then they go and present those uh, facts uh, to a jury uh, in, uh, when the case comes to trial. Doing that completely and effectively and to the highest standard has been our goal and we have well been able to achieve that. We have 30 medical examiners here in New York City. There are only 500 board certified medical examiners in the entire United States. There are 2,000, over 2,000 medical examiner and coroner offices throughout the United States. So you can easily see the math that does not work. The quality of death investigation varies dramatically across the United States. We're very fortunate here in New York City to have had a very, uh, very great support since Mayor Koch's uh, era, and um, that continues uh, through today. So we're not feeling it here in New York City yet, but it's a huge uh, problem uh, nationwide. I do also want to point out that the, of those 500 medical examiners, 100 of them have been trained in New York City. We have the largest training program for medical examiners in the United States. So our footprint uh, is large and we're certainly not only doing a great service for New York City by providing young medical examiners for this city, um, but also across the nation, literally from the chief medical examiner in Hawaii to the chief medical examiner in Maine. So I just want to say that I'm elated that uh, I'm here today. So I think uh, the fact that you're holding this meeting, uh, to me, is, is definitely an inspiration that forensic sciences are important in the city of New York. And, and I want to thank you for that uh, before I move forward. Um, Commissioner O'Neill, the police commissioner of the city of New York, is extremely supportive of the Forensic Investigations Division and the forensic functions in the NYPD. So he has um, provided us with the support here as far as our upstaffing. He's resilient and responsive. And um, I, I have to say that uh, he, he's, he's nonetheless but an amazing leader that has come all the way through on the end of forensic services. Um, the, the one thing to talk about, uh, this is my 21st year working in forensic investigations, and uh, this is a passion. There's nothing else I want to do. I want to help the public. I want to help the public be safe, and at the same time, I want to have science do more to make certain we're bringing the truth to the courts and the criminal justice system, without a doubt. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about in great detail today is the very fact that we have historic lows in gun violence. And I can tell you that with our partners at the OCME, collectively, we have seen a significant increase in the number of DNA hits since we've worked on an initiative regarding firearms and firearms violence in the last two years. We have seen an increase of 312% in regards to DNA hits when it comes to having a named person to a firearm in the last two years. And I can say that in, without any uncertainty that this is attributed to the work done collectively by the forensic service providers in the city of New York. But what I do see forward looking at the future path 
for forensic science is that things are becoming more and more technical that extend beyond DNA laboratories and simply the laboratory work. It connects out to the crime scene. It connects out to the technology in crime scenes. It connects out to the actual collection methods and the standardization of collection methods. And the, the one thing that I would ask is to take a look uh, in certain instances at the facility that we have, for example, in our police laboratory. I know the medical examiner, the forensic biology laboratory, recently had a, a new structure built, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, on our end, we have a retrofitted department store out in Queens on Jamaica Avenue, which uh, we love very much and, and we take to heart as far as it being our home. But as I just pointed out to you, uh, I'm so limited with space that I had to start a night shift in order to be responsive to the mayor's initiative on healing. So looking at potentially a new building or new space to take into consideration the fact that technology and forensic sciences will grow and continue to grow we see increases in evidence in almost every particular area, primarily the identification techniques. And in that particular sense, uh, I think our physical structure is something where I think in the next decade or so, in order for us to operate effectively and adequately and meet the expectations of the public to provide quality and accurate results, we need to be in a new facility. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, we will continue to have that conversation uh, on the finance matter. Um, I made sure I told my analysts to record that so we can talk to the department about that. But thank you so much. I want to turn this back over to my co-chair. Really appreciate the work you do and looking forward to working with you. Thank you for the work. Thank you for being here and uh, really appreciate it. Thanks. And we agree with you on uh, Commissioner O'Neill. I think both the chair and I, he's been a great leader and a good person to partner with. I want to turn it over to Councilmember Barron. Uh, did you have a question, Councilmember Barron? Yes? Yes. Great. Sorry for the delay. Uh, thank you very much. What is the relationship uh, between the police medical, what is it, um, and, the, and the chief medical examiner's office? What was the first part of the question? Mm -hmm. the yes. Oh, the, the, the NYPD what? runs their crime lab that focuses. Can you pull the mic a little closer to you? All right, sure. That focuses on non biologic evidence, as we were just discussing, while the OCME runs the forensic laboratories that are responsible for biologic evidence, mostly, uh, entirely, uh, okay. DNA for forensic biology and toxicology specimens. Okay. So the medical examiner does the autopsy. That's one of the things we do, correct. And the medical examiner gives the manner of death, the cause and the manner of death. Why would a medical examiner not give the man manner of death? We do give the manner of death. Okay. I'm referring back to 1983, to the case of Michael Stewart, who was beaten by transit officers, who uh, was brutally beaten and went into a coma. He was in a coma for 13 days, and then he died. The medical examiner was Elliot Gross, and the district attorney was Robert Morgenthau. Are you familiar with that case? No. Oh, okay. During, it was revealed that during the time of this autopsy, uh, it was alleged that the police officer, the transit police who arrested Michael Stewart for graffiti had beaten him and had put him in a chokehold, and that's what sent him into the coma. The medical examiner at that time removed Michael Stewart's eyes, which I've been told would have shown tension in the eyes that would have been caused by pressure that might have been put on the throat. He removed the eyes and put them in a solution which would in fact obscured that evidence that might have been determined from examining the eyes in the state in which they were at the time of death. And he did not give the manner of death. He gave the cause of death, but not the manner of death. It was quite controversial at that time, 1983. There were many people, activists, and others who came out and said that this had been a great mi miscarriage of justice because evidence had been tampered with or mishandled under the office of the medical, chief medical examiner. I and so, it was an outrage. 
I couldn't, did you have that specific question, then I'll be glad to respond to that. Right. What exists, first of all, is that true? That taking the eyeballs, removing them, and putting them in whatever type of solution it was, my chemistry is long gone, <laughs> would in fact alter what would be the findings in that case? Um, I am not acquainted with that kind of method. These days, we only remove eyes in baby cases where we need to examine the retina, which is the part of the back of the eye. Uh, if it w was looking at the eyes for signs of choking or uh, strangulation, yes. is done by just looking externally at someone's eyes, uh, whether they're living or dead. We can see little hemorrhages in Exactly. There. Right. So that was the point that was raised. <laughs> Why would the medical examiner do that, which would alter the findings, right. and so, why would he refuse to give the man of death? So basically, my question is, I wanted to put it on the record that we've not always had 100 um, percent honesty, uh, transparency in what goes on, and what exists now so that we can say that it won't happen again. Well, I couldn't be more happy that you rose, raised that question because the state of the medical examiner's office in the late 70s and 80s, exactly the period that you described, you said it was 1983, Correct. was a disaster. It was an, an embarrassment for New York City. Routine New York Times articles about situations like you uh, just described. The uh, often manners of death were left blank or just called undetermined uh, because they couldn't be sure. Different cases, whether law enforcement was involved when a, during a police shooting, for example, they might issue a different manner of death than they would if a so-called layperson was involved in the shooting. You know, if uh, I shot someone, that would be a homicide. If a police officer did it, they'd leave it undetermined. We just right. don't know. We don't do that anymore. What happened was, in the late 80s, a commission was formed under Mayor Koch. Uh, called the Lyman Commission, and there's a Lyman report that exists that I would be glad to share with you. It's a chilling description of the medical examiner's office at that point, and Dr. Hirsch, my predecessor, as well as I, keep that report on our desk as a constant reminder, and every medical examiner who comes in reads that report to see where we came from. And this Lyman Commission identified the problems in New York City, made a number of recommendations. A nationwide search was done for a medical examiner who would fix these problems, and Dr. Charles Hirsch, who was my predecessor, who was chief medical examiner for 24 years through four different mayors straightened out the office. The procedures starting, he came January 3rd, 1989, and since then our office has had a radical transformation, uh, and things like you described would not happen today. I absolutely guarantee you that. Um, great. I thank you for that. And finally, just a comment um, in terms of gathering evidence. We know that the Attorney General has a special investigator when there is a police involved shooting uh, of an unarmed person. And I have grave concerns with that because it's an incident where the police are allowed to gather the evidence that would be needed in the case of a police, fellow police officer, killing an unarmed person. So I think that there's a problem there, that you're allowing the same department that needs to defend itself or to gather evidence, uh, doing both at the same time, I think, is, is, um, needs to be addressed. And we've addressed that to the Attorney General. How can you rely on the police department to gather evidence in a case that would be brought against another police officer? So I just wanted to put that on the record as well. And that's what happened in the Delron Small case, which just recently concluded. And we raised that with the Attorney General. How can you rely on the police to gather evidence so thank you to both chairs. Of course. Thank you, Councilmember Barron, as always, uh, for your questions. Uh, I want to turn it back to Councilmember uh, Gibson, who I think is going to ask Councilmember Williams uh, to, uh, uh, before we call up the public, Councilmember Williams has a bill that's being heard today, and the NYPD testified on this bill earlier, and so we want to give him an opportunity to have a back and forth with the NYPD on this proposed piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in particular for uh, having this bill heard and, and work with me to make sure it's heard uh, in this term, although um, uh, probably to the delight of the NYPD, we probably won't be able to vote it on uh, this term, but I did thought it was a very important piece of legislation to have a discussion around particularly uh, where we are. Uh, it is the right to record. Just to be clear, we've made, I think, uh, some, some very good advances, uh, particularly in this city, 
Um, and I think across the country, some folks can learn about what we're doing here. Um, there's been some movement in the across the country as well. Um, finally, there's an officer uh, who was uh, going to be in jail for a while for killing Walter Scott Lee. Um, uh, although uh, the murder of Eric Garner hasn't uh, been held to justice, uh, we saw it on video. And I say that because without the cameras, without many of the videos, uh, the progress we've made, which is clearly not enough, wouldn't even be here. So those videos have been important pieces of any progress that people would agree uh, that we've made, and without them, um, I don't know where we would be. And so it's an important right to make sure it's not just there in name, uh, and also, but it's also there in, in reality. And so in the, in the briefing report, I just want to read a few things just to help put in context. The first, uh, according to a CCRB report, worth a thousand words examining officer interference with civilian recordings of police, published in June 2017. From January 1, 2014 through December 31st, 2016, the CCRB closed 257 complaints covering 346 allegations in which civilian, re civilians reported that officer interfered with their ability to, accord, to record. In 58% of these complaints, civilians were recorded, we were recording their own interaction with police officers, and the remaining 42% were bystanders recording or uh, attempting to record an encounter with a th third party. Of the 346 interference related allegations, the CCRB substantiated 28% of those. Um, complaints of verbal abuse included commands to stop recording, commands to leave the area, threats of physical force, and complaints of physical interference included use of asp, nightstick, pepper spray, or other means of physical force against a civilian to stop them from recording, physically seizing or detaining recording civilian, physically blocking the view, and recording the civilian as a means of intimidation. According to the CCRB, the patrol guide commonly refers to a civilian right, civilian's right to record indirectly and briefly in an unrelated section entitled Arrests, Arrests General Processing. While the NYPD more explicitly included the right of civilians to record in the finest message issued in 2014 and an internal, internally circulated legal bulletin in 2016 with clear detail and specific examples, this content was not further included in the patrol guide, which would allow police officers an ease of reference. One, I just want to see, know if the NYPD has read that report. Yes, I've read the report in preparing for the hearing. They made uh, a bunch of suggestions. One of them was recommending that it was added to the patrol guide. Is there any reason why it wasn't? Or, and are, there, are there any other of the suggestions that were followed? Well, I, I look through the suggestions uh, in the report and to see there are a couple of things that the department's doing I think that's worth mentioning. Um, as you said, in 2014, we've put out a finest message that was directed at all members of the service indicating that individuals recording police activity are engaged in lawful activity and they should not be interfered with um, absent the, the only type of enforcement that we would take in that scenario, and I think you addressed this in your bill as well, is if an individual is interfering with a police officer uh, engaging in their lawful duties. So short of that, an individual can record a police officer. Uh, an officer may ask them to move back a little if they're too close to the police action, but short of that, they're allowed to record. What we did, what we did after that is we, we also included it in the patrol guide section that you mentioned in the general arrest processing section. And then we issued a, a very detailed legal bureau bulletin and disseminated that to all police officers. They get that on their smartphones now and it's posted on the department's intranet for officers to, to be able to review. I think also worth noting that both whether it's the finest message, the legal bureau bulletin, the patrol guide section, when we as a department draft uh, promotional exams, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, uh, information is, questions are created based on information gleaned from these various types of department directives. On top of that, since 2015, we've identified 65 separate trainings that have been done uh, in the department where an individual's ability to, re where an individual's right to record was brought up and explained to officers in those settings 
and they were told that individuals are engaged, are in fact engaged in legal conduct when they're recording, short of interfering with, with police conduct. So why not just add it to the patrol guide in a more specific way? Uh, we're, we're not necessarily opposed to it. We've, we've done a variety of different methods, but I mean, that's certainly something we can review. Uh, I, I, that's something certainly we can review. And so one of the, it seems like the primary opposition, I'm just going to read from your testimony, the department opposes this legislation. Individuals who believe either that they have been falsely arrested or have had their property wrongfully seized can currently seek remedies in court. Which, which remedies can they seek? Well, I think as you mentioned in your bill that there are existing remedies in court, whether you're filing a state action, a federal action against an officer, whether it be for violation of their uh, right against unreasonable search and seizure, if a phone is taken unreasonably and with, with no legal basis from an individual, if an officer acts under color of law in a way that, that diminishes the right of an individual, there's a current recourse, and I, you highlight that in, in your bill, that there are all of these avenues. But you, you understand that the avenues that exist because of the resources that are needed uh, often dissuade people moving forward. And so we've had a number of bills come out of this committee uh, and just the council in general, I think, that are meant to supplement what already exists to give people a private right of action uh, more locally than what's, ex than what's available. Do you understand that part? Well, uh, not really in the sense that an individual, an individual filing a lawsuit against the police officer of the department of the city would still have to avail themselves in state court, in federal court. Uh, I'm, I'm, in this case, it would be, I'm assuming, in state court. Um, but some so, people believe federal. But yeah. uh, right. So, uh, I mean... It's hard to go to federal court. I'm sorry? It's sir? hard to go to federal court. Right, right. Uh, right. So, uh, I mean, the mechanism is there is a cause of action created, a private right of action created, and we believe on a very broad standard, so it will invite uh, a significant amount of litigation against officers because, if, if quoting the bill, if an individual is recording or attempting to record, and the fact that they're attempting to record, we're not sure what exactly constitutes an attempt to record, and they're interfered with, and interference again, there are a few examples given of what interference may be, but it's not limited to those examples. And part of the, the four enumerated points are preventing or attempting to prevent an individual from recording. These are very, very broad standards, and an individual can very easily, uh, there could be significant frivolous litigation against an officer for simply standing in the frame of a camera exercising their lawful duties, but since these terms aren't really defined, it's inviting these type of lawsuits against police officers, against the police department. So, I, one, I, I, I understand that there's always going to be difficulty in these conversations, regardless of what it is, even if it's the most innocuous thing, it's always going to be responded to uh, making the conversation difficult. There's going to be some people, I think, that testify later, not as much as it would have because of the late time and there's some some other bills that people are focused on right now. So uh, we, we're going to have some people testifying, complaining about uh, their problems actually in the street trying to do this. But I want to just separate them out because there are specific examples that you talked about that is wording of the bill, which I'm happy to go into. Then there's the general theory. I just want to first understand it. Let's assume that we can fix all the wording you're talking about. Would the department agree that we could have a private right of action locally for people who are aggrieved? No, I mean, I think that that's, I, I think that the department is, agree, is in agreement with you, and I, I think we've exhibited that because the directives we've put out in, in many, in, in both the finest message, the legal bureau bolt, and the patrol guide procedure predate the introduction of the bill. So we, we did recognize that with technology becoming more prevalent, with individuals carrying phones around in, in, in public and videotaping officers, that we needed to ensure that officers understood that individuals are allowed to do this and that you shouldn't interfere. So, and I think, I think an important part to mention is if we look at even the CCRB report that you mentioned, from 2014 to 2016, there were 257 complaints. I think the important part to realize there is 
from 2014 to 2016, there was a 40% reduction in complaints over those years, while at the same time CCRB highlights that the amount of cameras have significantly increased over that time. I think also important to recognize is of that 200 of those 257 complaints in three years, that amounted to less than 2% of overall complaints to CCRB, and of that 257, about 60% of those complaints were either unsubstantiated, determined to be unfounded, or the officer was exonerated. So I think we're heading down the right path. I think the training, the department directives we're putting out, the training that we're doing, and re, re, kind of reinforcing it through training, through different avenues within the department, I think we're having a very significant effect. I think CCRB's data demonstrates that. So in that sense, we are in agreement with that part of the bill that says individuals have the ability to do this. I think once we go down the road of creating private rights of action, I think that's that the concept we are opposed to, that there are rights of action currently and there shouldn't be a new right of action created. And then with respect to the reporting provision of the bill, I think the type of data that the, that the bill calls for simply can't be collected. Uh, I, I think... So it, I just want to jump in a little bit because I'm not, I'm not sure how much time I have. I want to not abuse it. But, um, but I just want to separate it out because you're going into now the details of the bill of specific things that could be changed. I want to put that in a box because we, will, we won't get to there mm -hmm. because you've already said you don't agree with it in theory. So I want to just stick with that part. You, didn't, you don't agree with creating a local private right of action. Correct. So I want, to, I want to focus on that just a little bit because that's actually a comment that comes up most times when we're trying to create a private right of action. And to read from, from your testimony again, it would instead create an unnecessary avenue for additional litigation against police officers the police department and the city as a whole. Can you give me an example of where this body has created a local private right of action and it has created um, an additional problem for litigation against police officers? I, I think, uh, honestly, we, the department does not defend itself. Uh, you know, the law department defends, uh, I think, the, the city council and, and city agencies, so that's data that I would, I would have to get from them. But I, I think it's, it's a reasonable conclusion to draw that when a right of action is created with such broad terms and broad standards built into it, that it's a very reasonable conclusion that there will be a significant increase in lawsuits and based and I, I would assume that based on the broad language that a lot of them will be found frivolous in the sense that if we look at CCRB's substantiation rate, if we if we're looking at sixty percent of, so, of uh, let me let me just say because again, I don't want to talk about the language because I think we can find a way to get language that uh, would be agreeable. You, uh, you're, uh, you're opposed to the concept, so I'm going to just stay on the concept, not about the language of the bill, because the language part comes secondary if both parties agree uh, that it's a good thing to codify. And right now you said you don't think it's a good th a well, thing th to codify. There's, right. There's already a cause of action in state So I'm going to get to that. Right? So um, contrary to popular belief, I actually try to listen to, uh, whenever I'm doing things around policing, to make sure I'm listening to officers and, and bills I've passed have, have actually been changed because of that. Sure. Believe it or not, even the PBA <laughs> I've, I've, I've listened to and try to uh, affect to make sure I'm not doing something that unnecessarily uh, prevents an officer from doing the job that they were hired to do. Um, uh, so I've worked with you many times uh, on these bills, so yeah, I, I, I would second that. Thank you. Um, with this bill, it sounds remarkably familiar to when we were passing the bias based policing bill, um, part of the Community Safety Act. Literally, uh, we were told there would be a cottage industry that would be created, because there was a ban already, same, same, policy, same process. There was already a ban on bias based policing. The same avenues existed uh, that existed then. Uh, and, and we were told uh, that that was enough, and we passed the bill anyway. Uh, there hasn't been a cottage industry, and you can tell me if it has significantly affected officers' ability to do something, or how many officers uh, have felt that they were sued because of this bill uh, frivolously. I mean, again, th those are numbers law department would have. Um, I'm very happy to look at them and get back to you. All right. I, it's important because if you're going to make this statement, and we have a lot of uh, previous history with this statement and passing bills, that statement never comes to fruition. 
As in fact, I would say most of the opposition that we've heard from NYPD on bills that we passed um, don't come to fruition. And I just want to give credit to this particular commissioner and this uh, agency. Now in this administration, the conversations are much easier, and so I'm thankful for that. That doesn't mean we, have, we don't have to stop pushing. And this bill in particular, I think, is important for people on the ground who routinely experience this. And I know why people always push back on a private right of action, but I, don't, I have not con been convinced. I haven't seen any data. And my own experience with bills is that it does not create a, a cottage industry. It does not create unnecessary um, litigation against police officers. And so that is just unpersuasive. And so what I'd like to find, uh, because uh, you know, I have some big dreams in this body, and hopefully uh, next year they may come true, they may not, uh, but I hope I will still be here, and it is something that I want to proceed uh, pushing forward. I'd like to do it in conjunction with the department, and I'd really like to um, get what the real, what the real concerns are. Uh, the litigation necessarily by itself, based on experience, is just not a real concern. I, I do want to make sure that if there's overbroad language or if there's things that we can change, that get exactly to the heart of what we're saying happens. But there's always a rejection. Well, I, as you said, I, I, think, I think you said it right. This, the hearing uh, relative to this intro is, is a starting point for the conversation. Um, and what I'll commit to you is that I'll be in contact with the law department after this hearing. We'll take a forensic look at the various bills passed by the council that contained a private right of action. And we'll, we'll reference that with the data relative to an increase, possibly decrease, or flat line on litigation. So this way we'll have concrete examples to give you one way or the other. Any reason why I wouldn't have that data if you were making a statement on this bill for this hearing? Well, I, I'll promise you that I'll take a look at the data moving forward. Sure. Any reason you wouldn't have that data if you were going to make the statement? For this hearing? I think the statement is based on an obvious observation that based on the broad language of the bill and I think I don't think we can get away from the language and, and separate the concept from the language because Why? because if you take a look at the broad language of the bill it is only reasonable to conclude that such broad language such a broad standard will invite litigation. Uh, I'm sure that the bills that you're referencing were subject to significant uh, negotiation that law department weighed in on and made more focused language there. But again, I'll have to take a look at those particular bills. This is an unnegotiated bill. It's an introduced yeah. bill. And, and the language that's present in the bill can't be ignored. And I think one, one issue feeds off of the other. I think it's very, very reasonable to assume that, leave, that reading this bill as it stands will invite additional litigation, significant additional litigation, but much so of which will be The fruitless. words as it stands can denote that there is an agreement in principle, and I'm saying it doesn't even sound like the, like if we found language that was more fine-tuned and wanted to codify uh, an individual's right to record and give them a private right of action, it sounds like you would not support that either. So that's why I just want to. I mean, I, I think our, as I've said, I think our issue is with the private right of action. That's what I, I'm saying. Right. I, but I, I think that an individual's right to record or their ability to, do, to engage in this activity has has been put forward by the department, predates the bill. We recognize it with the evolution of technology and we made a point of training our officers. Well, so uh, what I we found is that without something backing up what we're saying, people don't often listen to it. And so uh, the reason we had to pass a bias-based policing one with an, it was called an enforceable ban is because the one for all intents and purposes that existed wasn't enforceable because of the amount of resources that were needed to enforce it. So but, I, but I think if we, if we take a look at the bill and the CCRB data that, that you highlight, I think that what we're doing is working and it's actually proven by the CCRB data. So we've taken it upon ourselves to, to reinstill or reinforce this information. We've trained our officers based on our own initiative. So I want to, the, I want to the, be clear what you're saying. But I think it's important to say yeah. that the training and the department directives and the, and the work that we've engaged in is actually proving and, and bearing fruit. We see a significant decline in the number of complaints CCRB is seeing by 40 percent in their three-year study. At the same time, CCRB acknowledges that the number of these phones that are being used, the recording devices, has increased. 
So with an increase in devices and a decrease in, in, in the number well, of complaints. I will say I do know there are, personally, there are numerous amounts of times where this happens that are not reported to CCRB. And I think you probably agree with that as well. And so uh, I use the CCRB, which is great. And we're going, one of the data points I use to know that we're moving in the right direction is the fact that complaints are down all around for police, which I think is just a fantastic data set. Uh, with the dropping of shootings, the dropping of murders, the dropping of summons, each of those is work we could do that you know, I talk about, which we should, particularly around transparency and accountability, where we haven't moved and we've gone backwards on some. Uh, but the, the, those are good data sets, and that doesn't mean the problems that still exist within them, we shouldn't address. And so it sounds like you're saying what you're doing, you think addresses it fully, which again is what we always hear when we want to codify stuff. I, I and, think, but the last part is... I think um, just, just to answer that one point, I think what we're doing is significant and I, I think it, it, it's, it's bared out in the statistics for, from CCRB. But as we always say, and I think as, as you've seen through our action over the last four years, that we're always ready to engage with the council. We're, I think this is a conversation opener. I'm more than willing to have a conversation with you on this topic as we did with many other topics. We may not agree on certain points of the bill, but I think we're in agreement as to what this bill is trying to do, which is to let individuals know that they have the ability to engage in that conduct, which is reporting police activity. Well, I appreciate it, and I'm going to hold you to the last part of what you said, which is what you disagree with certain points in the bill which is different than what it sounded like when you started. So I'm just going to stop. I'm going to hold that piece there. Um, I, I do want to also mention that um, most times the, the, the administration, the council, they don't want us to codify things, and there's different reasons. But our position, uh, maybe one day it might change when I sit in a different seat, but our position uh, is uh, the administration's changed. So even if we have an administration that we think is doing what it should be doing or moving in the right direction, that administration is not going to be there forever. It's much easier to change policy, training, directives than it is to change codified law. And that's why it's another reason why it's important. Just uh, briefly a couple of questions and then I'll turn it back over. Uh, do you have any numbers on how many internal investigations are conducted by the NYPD annually of incidents where officers are accused of obstructing or interfering with these con constitutionally protected activity? And how uh, many have responded, resulted in disciplinary charges and specifications? No, I, I don't. I'm, I, again, I reviewed CCRB's numbers. Um, I would assume that those, the substantiated uh, complaints were referred to us at some point, but I'll take an independent look to see if there were any complaints made directly to us. I'm sure that if, if, there, are, if there is a number there, it would be a significantly smaller number than the CCRB number. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when this comes up again, and I'm, I'm sure it will, my hope is that we have the numbers at the time that the, the, the hearing occurs so we can have a, a more in-depth conversation. Uh, but looking forward to continuing to work within this, and thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Williams, and we do have other panels that are following you, so I always ask with all of my hearings that you allow uh, one of the members of your team to remain behind for the rest of the hearing to hear the other panelists that are coming before the committees. So I want to thank you for being here. I mean, we've talked about this uh, quite a bit, but for me as chair of the committee, it was really uh, a greater understanding of the world of, of forensic science and technology from both the NYPD Crime Lab as well as the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. So I look forward to our continued work. Thank you so much for your service to our great city, and I look forward to seeing you again. Happy holidays. Thank you. Our next panel that we're calling is Sarah Chu from the Innocence Project, Joshua Carmen from the Legal Aid Society, Julie Fry from the Legal Aid Society, Marika, okay. Marika Mice from the Bronx Defenders, and Guy Ramondi from the Brooklyn Defender Services. Please come forward. Thank you all once again for being here. Okay. We have Sarah Chu, Joshua is here. Okay. We have Julie. 
Okay, Marika is here and Guy is here. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Okay, I thank you all for being here. There is one more panel after you as well. So as this is my last hearing, I'm going to be extremely generous and I do not always do this. I am not going to put you on a time, but I'm going to ask you out of respect to all of your colleagues, if you can be as clear and concise uh, as possible. And if you have any written testimony, please make sure you give it to the Sergeant at Arms and we will make sure we have it for uh, our record. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for all the work you do and I'm looking forward to hearing your testimony. You may begin. Hello. Chairperson Gibson, Chairperson Johnson, and members of the committee, thank you so much for holding this hearing today. It couldn't have come at a better time. My name is Sarah Chu, and I'm the Senior Forensic Policy Advocate at the Innocence Project. And as you know, our organization's mission is to free the staggering number of innocent people who remain incarcerated to bring, and to bring reform to the system responsible for their unjust imprisonment. For today's hearing, I'd like to focus on what New York City can do now to ensure foren transparency in forensic practice and to ensure that it's more accurate and more reliable. Currently, there is a pending complaint at the Office of the Inspector General at the, uh, in New York State with regard to in-house methods that were developed at OCME. Right now, the state of New York relies on the Inspector General to be the primary system of public accountability in forensic science. And this raises concerns for a few reasons. First, the Inspector General is the dedicated public uh, um, system of accountability because of a grant called the Paul Coverdell Forensic Science Improvement Grant. It's a federal grant that laboratories receive and as a condition of receiving this money, they appoint an independent external investigator that investigates any allegations of negligence or misconduct that any citizen can raise. Now, if Congress doesn't, re, uh, if Congress doesn't fund this grant in the future, we may lose that independent investigator. And that's a problem because, first of all, the New York State Commission on Forensic Science, which was raised uh, previously, has proven to be inadequate in providing oversight for forensic science services in New York State. At the commission, at the request of a commissioner even, OCME was asked to turn over internal validation studies for one of its techniques. The commission voted against it. When the FBI notified the commission that for decades it had been training examiners to conduct hair comparison evidence, uh, microscopic hair comparison analyses and teaching examiners to testify in an erroneous way and that New York State laboratories, including New York City laboratories, had examiners who were trained by the FBI. Um, when the FBI notified the commission, the commission debated this for two and a half years and eventually voted not to take action. So when the commission does not take action, the city council has an obligation to step in. We're deeply grateful to council member Ferreras Copeland for her leadership previously when she chaired the Women's Issues Committee, which led the passage of local laws 85 and 86 in 2013 with the Health Committee. And to council members Koo, Mendez, Van Bramer, and Williams, who were among the original co-sponsors of those bills in 2013. The bills, the bills were well written, but we've yet to see OCME's full implementation of those bills based on your legislative intent. For example, 
there has been a lot of concerns raised about the validity of bite mark comparison. And although OCME uses bite mark comparison, it has not done root cause analyses of, this, of their use of this evidence, even though that's required by Local Law 85. OCME has not turned over validation studies or other information related to scientific procedures, despite the fact that it's required by Local Law 86. When city agencies do not take action, the city council needs to step in. We rely on you to assure justice for the people of New York City. And the city council, we need you to be a safety net and to guarantee the public access to forensic science accountability when there are concerns that are raised. So to this end, in my written testimony, we are recommending um, four suggestions for how we can very simply improve public accountability in New York City forensic sciences. And we're only asking for changes that have already been positively and successfully implemented in the state of Texas. First, we'd like to ask that a formal online public complaint and disclosure provision be added to the root, root cause analysis bill. Second, we'd like to add specifics to the transparency bill. So when advocates or defenders are asking for raw electronic data or validation studies, that there will be no debate. Third, we would like to expand these bills to cover NYPD as well. All forensic science services in the city should meet the same requirements. And lastly, we have a broad diversity of stakeholders in the criminal justice system in New York City, and we can work together to advance justice by creating a task force to develop a defendant notification policy. When things go wrong, someone needs to let the affected defendants know. So taken together, these four recommendations, I believe, can help us identify errors when they happen, ensure that there's a fix to those errors that prevent them from happening again, and lastly, ensure that individuals who are, effective, who are affected have the agency to, to respond and to move forward as they see fit in their cases. If time allows, I would welcome questions with regard to how, why accreditation alone is insufficient, is insufficient for ensuring accuracy and transparency, as that was a topic that was previously raised. The Innocence Project encourages public, the public safety and health committees to take decisive action that is needed to keep New York City on the leading edge of forensic science accountability. We look forward to supporting and assisting all efforts that advance a forensic science system that is more accurate and more just. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who's next? Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Fry. I'm a staff attorney with the DNA unit of the Legal Aid Society. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Chairperson Johnson and Chairperson Gibson and the Committees on Public Safety and, and on Health for the opportunity to testify concerning forensic lab oversight in New York City. The Legal Aid Society believes this matter is of high public concern and is vital to the fair administration of justice. Year after year, we learned that innocent people have spent decades in jail based on faulty hair comparisons, bite mark analysis, and arson investigations, uh, what history has shown now to be junk science. And yet, forensic science is now an indispensable and ever-present part of the criminal justice system. Juries and judges, judges increasingly rely on the testimony of forensic scientists to sort the guilty from the innocent. The forensic scientist wields an incredible amount of power over the outcome of criminal cases. We've testified several times in the last few years about the lack of transparency and the defensive and secretive culture that we've encountered, particu particularly at the office of the chief medical examiner uh, at their forensic bio biology department. The council, to its credit, took a significant step toward creating accountability at the OCME through the passage of the local law 85 in, in 2013. Our more recent experiences, however, demonstrate that far more oversight is needed from the Council to create meaningful accountability and transparency in the New York City's forensic labs. And here, um, I, I know that Councilperson Johnson has already outlined 
the uh, recent complaints that we've made to the New York State Office of the Inspector uh, General very expertly, so I won't go over them in detail here because I understand that uh, the council people are already aware of our complaint. We have attached our full complaint as well as the OCME's reply and, and our response to their reply uh, to our written comments, and uh, we hope that the, uh, the council will have an opportunity, to, the committees will have an opportunity to review those. I would like to um, clarify uh, a, f a few points based on the co some of the comments that were made earlier by, by uh, those who testified for the OCME. Um, first of all, we are still uh, remain concerned about the use um, and the past use of both FST and LCN uh, at, at the OCME. And uh, we, uh, and the, uh, now the uh, current use of a new program called StarMix, which is also a probabilistic genotyping program like, uh, like FST. Uh, as uh, Councilperson Johnson has already correctly pointed out, this type of technology has been criticized in the PCAST report, um, and uh, this, the, which was a really historic report put out by some of the top scientists, not only in the country, but in the world. How would you respond, I don't want to cut you off, you can of course finish your testimony, but how would you respond to the chief medical examiners uh, trying to, you know, disregard uh, what that report said and saying that the former director of the FBI crime lab said that it was very, very problematic. From the Legal Aid Society perspective, how would you respond to the comments that were made earlier? Well, it's, it's very interesting to us that, that they chose to, to use the remarks of, of Dr. Bruce Padoli uh, to, to criticize PCAST because Dr. Bruce Padoli actually testifies an, as an expert witness for the Legal Aid Society in our Fry hearing against LCN and FST and said that both of those techniques were invalid and unreliable. Uh, so to say that he uh, somehow endorses the idea of FST uh, really goes counter to his sworn testimony um, in, in uh, the Fry decision in, in People v. Collins Peaks, and we are happy to provide that to the council where he goes into detail about why both of those technologies should not be used in the courtroom. But was there validity to what the chief medical examiner said related to uh, the scientist who you just referenced and who she referenced saying that there were some problematic and non-reliable things that came out of that PCAST report? So uh, I am not a scientist, but the people who comprised PCAST are, like I said, some of the top scientists in the world. It was co-chaired by Eric Lander, who's the lead author of the Human Genome Project. Uh, some of its members included people like Syl Sylvester James Gates, who's a renowned astrophysicist who is the winner of the National Medal, Medal of Science. So if there are specific ways in which the, the, the report was flawed, uh, certainly that can be discussed. But to just dismiss it as political without any evidence of it being so, certainly this wasn't a body of politicians or even of lawyers. These were scientists, some of the most renowned scientists in the world, who, came, who reached these conclusions. I certainly don't te think their uh, conclusions can be dismissed so easily. Is this the first time you've heard uh, the report trying to be discredited, or before this hearing today, had you heard criticisms of the report in the past? The criticism I've heard of the report come primarily from uh, law enforcement, district attorneys associations, or from people within forensic science itself, but not, interestingly enough, uh, as far as I know, not from fields, out, not from sci other, other scientific disciplines outside of forensic science. So essentially what PCAST, what the, the essential criticism of PCAST is that forensic science should be subject to the same standards that other scientific disciplines are subject to, peer review, transparency, how, robust how, experiments. How, how many members of, the, of that commission were there? Do you know off the top of your head? I, it was a large commission. I don't know off the top of my head how many members. Okay. I apologize it, for interrupting yes. your testimony. You may f finish. I apologize. Absolutely. Feel free to interrupt at any time. I would, I'd love to, the opportunity to clarify um, any questions the council may have. Uh, uh, back to our, our, um, our, our Coverdale complaint against uh, the OCME. Um, in addition to our sort of global concerns about the use of FST, the reliability of FST and LCN in the courtroom, we found that the OCME had frankly been untruthful with uh, the bodies that were charged with this oversight about the, the validation studies and the source code 
um, that they uh, that they used um, when um, getting approval for those methods. And uh, Ms. Chu from the Innocence Project already outlined one, sense, some, one such instance with regard to LCN, which we uh, detail in our um, in our comments and on our Coverdell complaint itself, where they were specifically asked um, about the existence of a specific study in their validation of LCN, and, a, and an official from the OCME gave just a false answer to uh, to the commission with respect to that uh, the, the existence of to the of that study. Um, with regard to FST, we have tried for years to obtain the source code for that software program to review it to make sure that it was functioning accurately, that it did what was described by the OCME on the stand. We were unsuccessful in our efforts to procure that in state court. Um, however, a federal judge just last year ordered the OCME to provide the source code in a criminal case, and an expert who reviewed it found that it functioned very differently from the way it was described by the OCME in their published papers, in the validation, in the, um, in the reports that they gave to the New York State Commission in order to get it validated, that they had essentially changed the source code um, from its original, uh, its ori from the original code somewhere after it was approved and did not report this based on finding a, a very significant error in the way that it was functioning and did not report this to anybody, not the New York State Commission, not the defense, not even the prosecution, not, not even the prosecutor's office. Um, and this type of lack of transparency and lack, lack of forthrightness is what we uh, are concerned with at the OCME, that there is this culture of defensiveness and secretiveness there um, that still exists. Um, with regard to FST... Um, Julie, I, Julie, right? Yes. I have a, just have a question on that. Uh, so, and I'm not looking, I'm not trying to elicit or solicit you attacking OCME with my question. You can, that's up to you, but that, I'm, not, I'm not asking you a leading question with what I'm about to say. It's hard when we hear from OCME and the folks that's out here today uh, a very strong, robust defense of their methods, of why they believe it's right, of why they believe they're not in contravention of the guidelines and regulations that were put in place for CODIS, and I tried to point out the gray area on the local database uh, through my line of questioning, it's hard to hear that and have that comport with what you're telling me. And so what is, what is your sense of why there are two different sort of stark realities or not realities here related to what OCME is telling us? Why do you think they are giving that, that line of defense so strongly because there wasn't, there wasn't much, uh, and again, I'm not saying this to attack Dr. Sampson. I work with her often. I think she's a very good person, and I admire the work that she's done over the course of her career. Why do you think she is uh, defending it in such a strong way when the legal community that works on these issues have such strong concerns and objections? Well, I, I won't pretend to know the individual motiva motivations of, of officials at the OCME, um, but what I, what I will say is that a sort of more global criticism of, of forensic, uh, forensic scientists and, and especially institutions and labs that are allowed to operate within, with, without transparency, and we've seen this in, in labs across the country where there have been scandals and labs have been shut down, is that a culture develop, develops that whereas these labs are held out to be independent, that without transparency, without accountability, they become more of a tool of law enforcement and less inclined to be uh, forthright and, um, and frankly honest with the public. Um, so, I, you know, I, I can't speak individually to the OCME's uh, uh, motivations, but I can say that we feel that it's, uh, that it's imperative that that culture not be allowed to thrive in New York City, and we think that there is a lot that the council can do to encourage more openness, more transparency um, from our labs so that that problem does not happen. And have any of the folks, and I apologize for having to step out to make a phone call, so if I miss some of your testimony, I have it, I'll read it. Um, uh, have any of the fo when I asked the question earlier, uh, if any of the folks who work in the legal community on these issues with nonprofit organizations and other legal defense organizations, uh, had anyone done a FOIL request on the protocols and guidelines associated with the local database, no one raised their hand. Um, and that sort of surprised me. Why is that the case? So, in, in we first of all, the Legal Aid Society has made several FOIL requests. We have actually several pending right now. 
um, with the OCME uh, and uh, have had various degrees of success uh, in obtaining information from them with respect to the guidelines regulating their local database, which I, I think that you were able to, um, to pull out that they have just sort of made up on their own. We did not know that there were that, got, that such guidelines existed. We had never heard of them before. So now we will be happy to uh, foil uh, whatever rules exist. We didn't know that there were any. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> Let, let's move on to someone else who will testify. I'll come, we'll come back for more questions so you'll be able to expound further on the things you wanted to present here today. But I want to be respectful of the other panelists that are up here as well. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Guy Ramondi, and I'm a supervising attorney uh, in the criminal defense practice of Brooklyn Defender Services. And I join with my colleagues here in their comments and recommendations on the OCME and on the NYPD Crime Lab. Now, Councilman, before I get to my comments, you did ask a question, a very important question, about critics of the PCAST report. My recollection is that during the comment period, the authors of the PCAST report actually issued an addendum indicating that there were some critics, primarily I think they were, they were district attorney organizations, and those critics had claimed that the the President's Council, the authors of the PCAST report, had overlooked some studies that established the, the validity of some of these disciplines. And so the authors of the PCAST report actually then uh, expanded the time period and asked them to submit any of these studies that they might have overlooked. Uh, and my recollection is that the addendum in the PCAST report indicates that those critics, those organizations, actually then um, withdrew their claims. They actually could not point to any um, of the studies that would establish the validity of those, um, of those various disciplines. So I, I believe, um, and I believe my organization believes that the PCAST report is, is a very solid report. Um, what I would like to talk to you um, in furtherance of transparency is Brooklyn Defender Services uh, is urging the City Council to require the NYPD lab uh, to list all of their laboratory protocols, validation studies, technical man manuals, and proficiency exams on the internet so that they will be available to the public. Uh, in 2013, this committee actually passed transparency legislation uh, with respect to the OCME, and the OCME has, in fact, to their credit, put those things on their website. Uh, on root cause analysis? Uh, there, there is not only validation studies, the, um, several other things. I, I, I don't know if all the root cause okay. analysis. Thank stuff. you very much. Right. Uh, but we would ask you to pass similar legislation requiring the NYPD uh, crime lab to post this uh, information on their lab. And I would think that um, the law that was passed in 2013, local law 86-2013, uh, could serve as the role model for such a bill. Uh, right now, Right now, in 2017, the NYPD Crime Lab uh, does not have its own website that contains uh, any of these uh, critical documents, uh, protocols, technical manuals, validation studies. Obviously, defense attorneys need these things in order to challenge the evidence in their particular cases, but uh, the public at large needs uh, to be able to access these things just to determine whether generally uh, their lab is in fact complying with national and international forensic testing standards. A and I think this is uh, particularly important in light of the, uh, the findings in the 2016 PCAST report because um, there is no doubt uh, that certainly with respect to things like uh, fingerprint matching and microscopic ballistics testing, and there was testimony about that with the earlier panel. Uh, there is no doubt that the PCAST report established uh, weaknesses and the fact that those disciplines are, in fact, in, in entirely subjective. Um, so I, I would think that uh, in the interest of transparency, having the protocols online would be uh, very important. Uh, I would like to address something that was discussed in the testimony uh, earlier today about uh, drug testing. And uh, it is gratifying to know that there will be, in the future, more technicians who will be doing drug testing for the NYPD lab. Uh, but what we would ask this council to do is to help us to make this priority one, uh, and that we ask you to support us in uh, 
in calling for the immediate and automatic testing of controlled substances, particularly in misdemeanor cases. And you may ask why I'm saying that it needs to be done in misdemeanor cases, and that is because lab testing of controlled substances in misdemeanor cases is particularly concerning because of a court of appeals case called People versus Kalin that in effect can leave innocent people incarcerated at Rikers Island for months without the testing of evidence in their case. You may be aware that with respect to defendants who are charged with drug felonies, uh, the prosecutor must, within six days of the defendant's arrest, present the grand jury with a lab report indicating that the item in question is, in fact, a controlled substance. Uh, however, um, uh, those safeguards or similar safeguards simply do not exist with respect to our misdemeanor clients. With respect to our misdemeanor clients, um, a prosecutor can secure the defendant's continued incarceration uh, simply uh, with an assertion by the recovering police officer that based on his or her training and experience and his familiarity with packaging, that the item in question is in fact a controlled substance. And so the actual testing by the lab is actually pushed down the road. It may very well be pushed down the road until the eve of trial. That's crazy. And it is, and you could have people, and we have had people, that have been incarcerated for a prolonged period of time and then it is discovered that uh, the, Unex the drugs that they were charged with were in fact not drugs, that there in fact was no crime committed. Uh, and so we would ur urge uh, this committee to get involved in that and, and make sure that there is immediate testing on, on misdemeanor drug cases. We, we, will, we will take a very, very serious look at this and we'd love to talk with you further about this in the new year. We appreciate that. The one last thing that I will briefly discuss since we are talking about transparency uh, is um, discovery. Uh, and my office has um, testified many times uh, before the Committee on Public Safety and Courts and Legal Services about the need for discovery reform at the state level. Um, but in, in cases involving forensic evidence, uh, early and automatic disclosure uh, of evidence is even more critical to ensure that uh, the defense has time to have experts uh, assess the evidence. Um, in, in Brooklyn, um, we are able to get discovery in most cases under an agreement with the DA's office, something called open file discovery. Uh, this is not the case in other boroughs. A and even in our borough, even with open file discovery, uh, critical documents are not turned over until months into the case and, and often not without some protracted litigation or back and forth. Um, one thing that I will uh, call the council's attention to is electronic raw data. That is not something that the OCME turns over as a matter of course. Our experience has been that uh, the OCME will turn over the electronic raw data uh, if they are given a judicial subpoena to do so. The problem is some judges are receptive to a defense request for a subpoena and others aren't. But, but I, I think it's very clear uh, that electronic raw data is essential in order for uh, defense counsel to be able to, to evaluate uh, their, their cases. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Very helpful testimony, all of you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marika Meese, and I am the legal director and the director of the Forensic Practice Group at the Bronx Defenders. I thank you for the time and the opportunity, and I do join the comments of um, my fellow um, people testifying already. Um, you know, the issue here is just that science and forensic science require openness and testing in order for them to be valid. And that's all we're seeking as defense counsel is an opportunity to objectively test, analyze, and interpret forensic evidence that's used against our clients where their liberty is at stake. Uh, it's fundamental uh, that transparency and openness are part of this process if these uh, disciplines are really scientific. Um, and I wanted to just mention briefly some of the reasons why we need to ask these questions and the kind of questions we need are things like, does the laboratory have protocols? Are they consistent with the scientific standards? Are the method methods used by the laboratory validated? What kind of validation was that? Was it the kind of validation OCME routinely does, which is only internal validation, or was it the kind of open validation science demands where people outside of that lab actually got to look at the methods, especially the controversial ones like FST and LCN, to see what's really being done there. Um, does a laboratory have protocols? 
Are they being followed? Are there profic proficiency tests? Do the proficiency tests actually use casework like material, or are they easy tests that aren't representative of the kind of things they see in actual casework? Um, are the tests administered blindly? Has the laboratory done anything to account for human error and cognitive bias? These are all fundamental concepts of science that apply equally to forensic science. Um, and I wanted to talk, talk specifically about a couple comments of the OCME during their testimony, uh, where Council Member Johnson, you raised some concern, specifically on the local data bank, when you asked initially about exclusionary or uh, abandonment samples, and they said, no, we don't put those in. Well, what they were referring to is, for example, a rape victim or a person who owns a place that's been burglarized. But later they finally answered that, yes, they actually do routinely put in their local data bank uh, a profile generated from someone who is exonerated and who is shown not to be a perpetrator of a crime. And they do so automatically and without clear legislative authority to do so. And the only way to get that profile out is by court order. But they don't even tell us or that individual that they have to seek a court order. So absent a court order using really specific language, both the swab with the genetic material and the profile remain forever to be tested against all um, evidence samples in the future with no reason to suspect that indi individual of anything, even if they've never been arrested or convicted of a single crime. And that is a genuine concern. But, but what about the issue that was raised by the general counsel from OCME saying that the way they've handled the local database has actually been helpful to organizations like the ones that are represented on this panel to actually exonerate people and to help people because of the way they've collected uh, these, these samples and the way they've stored them, that it's actually been helpful for certain defendants who have been unfairly convicted and uh, prisoned. How do, you, how do you respond to that? I think the bulk of exonerations come from them catching a real perpetrator whose profile ends up in a data bank because of a conviction in a permissible manner and not in the manner we just described, save perhaps the example the police gave. But that's another example of OCME, who's purportedly independent, working as an arm of law enforcement and keeping profiles with suspect legislative authority to assist law enforcement when they're supposed to be an independent agency. So it remains problematic in our opinion. Um, and then just briefly on the police lab, we did see some improvement with OCME since the passage of the bill in 2000, 2013 in terms of putting their protocols online and providing us with forensic profile and um, forensic biology case files more readily just by direct request. But again, they are a purportedly independent lab, whereas the bulk of um, other forensic evidence used against those accused of crimes comes from the NYPD. And with them, we see zero transparency. Not only do they not provide the protocols and the proficiency tests that they claim they do, but we don't even have access to what they're even really testing. You heard the police um, talk about in the fingerprint scenario how they take a high resolution image and use that to do a comparison, but we aren't provided with that high resolution image. Similarly, in the firearm analysis section where they do these microscopic comparisons of a bullet, a test fired bullet against a discharged bullet, and what they're supposedly looking for is matching, their protocols only require them to put a conclusion of a match or not, and they're supposed to document something. But they have $65,000 microscopes that can take high quality color images. They don't do that, and if they do ever take them, we don't get them. We get a low quality black and white photograph from which we can do no independent analysis or review of this so-called scientific evidence being used against people where their liberty is at stake. And if these disciplines are scientific, they are undoubtedly subjective. We agree with PCAST in that nature. But if they're scientific, if they're forensic science, then there should be openness and testing and an independent review um, by defense counsel. And um, just in closing, I did want to note that the Bronx Defenders offers strong support for um, intro 1265 
we do, or 1235, <laughs> We do believe that um, we've supported it since um, inception, uh, since it was introduced. We think that clearly there's been a, a benefit in having um, individuals use cell phone videos to capture police conduct and expose countless abuses. And we think that the private right of action does um, much to put value into that right. And we have clients at our office who are charged with um, interfering with police activity in this regard where we believe they were just exercising their constitutional right in an important way. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Yes, sir. Um, you could just speak into the mic. Sure. Thank you. I'm actually here to testify about right to record, so I'm not sure if that makes That's sense. Fine. That's okay. That's this? totally okay. fine. Um, just pull the mic a little closer because you, sure. you, sure. uh, you're on TV. I'm not sure how many people are watching, but they need to hear you. As I mentioned, um, I'm a legal aid society. I'm here representing uh, the Special Litigation Unit, which is a specialized unit that focuses us on systemic problems in the criminal justice system. Um, I feel like with the limited time I have, I should uh, probably respond to some of the things that were said by the uh, panelists from the NYPD who were here earlier. Um, in particular, uh, the NYPD is correct that um, courts have recognized that there is a right to record. Uh, but the remedies have been inconsistent and therefore they have been ineffective. The statute is important, the proposed bill is important because it sets forth a clear remedy. Uh, the NYPD referred several times that there are suits, that people have been able to bring suits for false arrest or unlawful seizure when they've actually been arrested or their, their recording devices have been confiscated. Um, these, however, are qualitatively different than the private right of action that is contained in the bill. Uh, which provides that uh, someone is, has a cause of action for any interference of any kind, not just for a full-blown arrest or a detention, uh, and provides a clear remedy. So then anything short of that, so when officers do attempt to block uh, recording happening or they confiscate and throw phones or they just threaten to arrest or give somebody a summons, uh, the bill would provide a private right of action for that. Um, Another reason why the bill is critical is because despite all the corrective actions that were touted by the NYPD up here earlier, they referred to issuing a finest message in 2014 and a couple of legal bulletins in 2016. Um, as a CCRB report uh, that was mentioned that covered from years 2014 to 2016 indicates it is not sufficiently, uh, whatever actions they have taken so far have not sufficiently deterred uh, police interference and in fact, um, that issue may actually be getting worse. Uh, the CCRB just recently issued a semi-annual uh, report that covers January and June of 2017. I'm sorry, January to June 2017 uh, that shows that for the same period compared to 2016, actually complaints about officer interference have gone up 400 percent during that period. So uh, that bears mentioning. Um, that said, if I still have time, I, I would just add that Legal Aid is a part of the Communities United for Police Reform Coalition. We hope everyone here uh, and everyone on the council will also sign on to the Consent to Search Act, which is uh, intro number 541, uh, but not the identification bill, uh, number 182. Um, I also would bring to your attention that uh, in our written testimony, which I've submitted, I won't go into details here, we do have some recommended revisions. Uh, to the language of the Right to Record Act or the Right to Record Police Activities Bill. Um, so please, uh, please, please, uh, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, and I believe that's probably all I'll say at this point. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for the sake of time. We really do have to move the hearing forward. But I do thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. And certainly we will uh, continue to follow up. And we thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Our next panel to call up is Michael Sisiski from the New York Civil Liberties Union, Sergio De La Pava from the New York County Defender Services, and Yul San Lu from the Justice Committee. Please come forward. You can begin. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Gibson. Uh, my name is Michael Szyzycki, Lead Policy Counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. I'll be testifying today in support of Intro 1235 of the Right to Record Act, as well as making recommendations for other steps the Council can take to improve police community relationships. The First Amendment protects the right to record the police in public. This is among the most direct and participatory forms of public oversight, and it can serve as a necessary check against official misconduct. In recent years, bystander report recorded footage of the police killings of Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Alton Sterling, and Philando Castile focused national attention on the systemic targeting of communities of color by law enforcement. Recognizing the power of video to tell uh, stories that are often unseen, the NYCLU developed an app to enable New Yorkers to turn their phones into tools to document racial profiling and expose the aggressive tactics used by law enforcement to prevent New Yorkers from filming. And with the surge of protest activity as New Yorkers resist threats from Washington, the NYCLU regularly trains volunteers on documenting and recording police activity at protests and demonstrations. Yet we constantly have to remind people that although they have the right to record, they may be at risk by exercising that right so long as officers continue to ignore it. Despite a long-standing consent decree and patrol guide policy, the NYPD has not respected the right to record police activities. Journalists have frequently been arrested for doing nothing more than reporting on matters of public importance. And in the current climate, where they are routinely attacked by a White House intent on discrediting a free press, safeguarding the ability of journalists to do their jobs is vital to protecting our democracy as is protecting New Yorkers' ability to get involved in public policy conversations. In 2012, the NYCLU filed a lawsuit on behalf of a woman who attempted to film a stop and frisk encounter. Instead of respecting her right to do so, the officers arrested her, threw her in a jail cell, and told her, this is what happens when you get involved. And while we know of countless examples like this and have some limited data from the CCRB, there's no comprehensive reporting on how often these encounters happen. Because it would fill the gaps in this data, the NYCLU enthusiastically supports the Right to Record Act's detailed reporting requirements, which will bring a powerful measure of transparency and crucially uncover racial disparities in law enforcement interference with the Right to Record. The Right to Record Act will make the First Amendment more easily accessible here at home through its private right of action, and it will say loudly and clearly that we are a city that values both the First Amendment and our rights to hold police accountable. We urge the Council to pass this measure into law. Lastly, this council has just days left to deliver on its promise to reform abusive and discriminatory police practices. In the coming days, members will be asked to vote on two bills collectively referred to as the Right to Know Act. Unfortunately, only one of these bills still deserves to carry that name and to be passed into law. The NYCLU fully supports and urges passage of Intro 541C, which will require the NYPD to inform people of their rights regarding searches unsupported by probable cause and to document proof of a person's knowing and voluntary consent to such searches. But we do not support Intro 182D. We had long supported earlier versions of this bill that would have required officers to identify themselves, tell someone why they were stopped, and offer that person a business card. This common sense proposal was a direct response to the lived experiences of New Yorkers of color who were repeatedly harassed by the police, but who lacked the most basic information needed for accountability, the names of the officers who mistreated them. But Intro 182D has carved out the most common law enforcement interactions from its coverage. While prior versions required officer identification during any investigative questioning, this latest version only applies to questioning where the person is suspected of criminal activity. But officers don't need to suspect someone of a crime to harass them or engage in misconduct. And we know of countless examples of New Yorkers harassed by the police who were never accused of or suspected of criminal wrongdoing, including women who frequently experience sexual harassment by officers in these lowest level encounters. We're talking about encounters that are the least transparent and the most susceptible to abuse with impunity. By excluding these interactions from coverage, Intro 182D allows officers to continue hiding behind anonymity and to exempt themselves from accountability for misconduct. This never should have been controversial. It's not controversial for New Yorkers to know the names of officers who stop them. It is not controversial for New Yorkers to have the most basic reason for why those stops are happening. And it is not controversial for officers to introduce themselves during traffic stops. What is controversial is elected officials cutting deals behind closed doors, cutting out the communities behind legislative proposals from the process, and failing in their obligation to be responsive to New Yorkers who are most directly impacted by police misconduct. Intro 182D is sadly representative of a missed opportunity to make genuine progress to shift the culture of policing. But that spirit is still present in Intro 541C, and the NYCLU urges the Council to stand with New Yorkers by passing Intro 541C into law. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be heard. I'm Sergio Dallapava of New York County Defender Services. 
I'll be brief, as I believe my colleagues have adequately uh, expressed what the Defense Bar feels about um, the Crime Lab and the OCME. Both entities, we believe, claim to be functioning entirely in the realm of dispassionate scientific inquiry, but the reality is far more troubling. The reality is an overriding lack of transparency and partisan secrecy. This leads to arrogance and sloppiness, which in turn creates wholesale injustice. New York City should lead the way for the nation in implementing meaningful reforms that will ensure the true independence and reliability of these vital operations. Recent events at OCME are illustrative of the problem. For years, the office conducted its DNA mixture testing under an entirely unwarranted cloak of secrecy. Unfortunately, lack of transparency is often a breeding ground for laziness and abuse. Here, the OCME used that unchallengeable platform to foster a reputation for unsurpassed expertise. This gave them the arrogance to introduce two highly troublesome techniques that would ultimately greatly reduce the reliability of their DNA testing and shatter their illusion of expertise. I'm speaking here, of course, of high sensitivity testing and FST. These techniques were used for 11 years in thousands of cases without significant external scrutiny and an environment primed for abuse. Only the skillful, pers skillful persistence of the defense bar ultimately revealed how scientifically unsound these practices actually were. A hugely important development, but one that is surely of minor consolation to the many, mostly indigent people of color, convicted on the basis of dangerously unreliable evidence. A similar reckoning would be highly unsurprising in the context of the NYPD crime lab, given what we've learned about the inherent unreliability of so-called forensic science. Last year's PCAST report established conclusively that the pattern matching that gets called forensic science is essentially subjective and partisan evidence building. And at least the OCME pretends to independence. The crime lab, on the contrary, makes no such claims, openly employing primarily former police officers in the place of unaffiliated scientists. This despite the obvious and growing recognition that the best way to prevent toxic errors in this field is by creating a forensic lab that is truly independent from law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies. New York must act now. Every day, the danger of wrongful convictions based on pseudoscience grows unjustifiably. True independence and impeccable reliability are achievable. The only thing lacking is the will. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Yilsan Lim. I'm a co-director of the grassroots organization called the Justice Committee. Um, some of our programming is aimed at spreading the practice of monitoring and documenting police activity as safely and effectively as possible in order to deter police abuse. This is a practice we call cop watch, and as you've heard, it's a constitutionally protected practice. We've been operating our cop watch program since 2007, and over the years of this work, um, the NYPD's practice of illegally uh, interfering with attempts to legally document their activity has been rampant and unchecked. Um, some of the ways in which the NYPD interferes with cop watching include verbal harassments, threat, and, and threats of violence or arrest, physical violence, using their bodies to block teams or individuals from filming, blocking and hiding their badge numbers, making false claims that documenting police activity is illegal, ordering those who are documenting to move and falsely claiming that they are blocking pedestrian traffic, shining police lights at cell phones and cameras, unlawfully confiscating recording equipment, slapping phones and recording equipment out of the hands of those who are filming, and unjustly issuing tickets and making arrests. <coughs> to give you some concrete examples from our experience um, and those of the organizations we work with, in March 2012, at the request of Councilmember Jumani Williams, the Justice Committee and the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement organized cop watch teams to monitor police repression of protests following the NYPD, excuse me, the NYPD killing of Kimani Gray. During these protests, three members of our teams were illegally arrested for documenting police abuse of the young protesters in East Flatbush. Two of those who were arrested were also brutalized. Notably, none were co ever convicted of a crime or violation. In more recent years, uh, the NYPD unlawfully arrested one of our members as he was recording in a subway. 
making the claim that lo the light on his cell phone violated recording laws. Again, there was no conviction in this case. The great majority of Justice Committee members and other members of COPWATCH teams and organizations have been bullied and threatened with arrest while exercising their constitutional right to record police activity. NYPD officers have demanded ID from our members while they were recording and then escalated incidents threatening our members with arrest if they asked questions or declined to produce identifications in situations where the law was they were legally allowed to leave. Um, once while our Jackson Heights Cop Watch team was documenting a street stop, one of the officers involved attempted to bribe the community member into telling us to stop filming by saying, if you tell them to leave, this ticket will go away. The community member did not comply with this, um, and we later learned that they actually didn't understand anything that was going on in the stop because the officers involved did not speak Spanish. Directly after this stop, the officers involved jumped in their vehicle, drove up the street, staged a stop. When the cop watch team came running up the block to see what was going on, they jumped back in their van laughing and drove away. We filed a CCRB complaint regarding this incident and never heard a response. Um, a police, once a police officer in the passenger side of an NYPD vehicle maintained his flashlight on our member's camera to interfere with recording, while another NYPD officer in the driver's seat held up his middle finger. Um, shining lights at uh, people who are attempting to record in order to interfere is a uh, very common practice and something most of our cop watchers have experienced. Um, in all of our years of experience, none of the offending officers have been held accountable, which allows and encourages the behavior to continue. We thank and commend Councilmember Jumani Williams for introducing Intro 235, which will establish a private right of action. We feel like it's a step in the right direction, but also want to highlight that in order for NYPD, this NYPD practice to stop, there has to be uh, significant discipline and accountability for officers who engage in this behavior. And I just want to conclude by echoing legal aid and NYCLU. Um, the Justice Committee also works with families who have lost loved ones to the police. And so on behalf of the family of Eric Garner, Romarley Graham, Sean Bell, Chantel Davis, and many, many others, we want to strongly urge the council to vote yes on 541 and no on 182. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I just want to make a quick comment, and it's one that's probably not going to make the folks on this panel happy, but I'm proud of Councilmember Torres. Uh, and the work that he's done. I understand that the advocates aren't happy. I think he's put a good faith, faith effort into this, and I, I support him on this, and I look forward to voting in favor of this measure. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we look forward to working with you. I definitely want to move the hearing, but I thank you so much for coming today and providing us testimony. We have our final panel this evening. I want to call up Tawaki Komatsu, representing himself. Please come forward. And I believe we have your testimony. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's interesting. Look at all this paperwork I got. I love it. Ow. Um, hi. Um, I've previously testified at uh, New York City Council meetings. I also have put um, your colleagues on notice of the fact that the mayor's head of security is currently a defendant in an active federal civil rights lawsuit uh, with regards to the subject matter, um, the last person who testified. The basis for that lawsuit is that he actually had someone arrested back in 2012 who was riding his bicycle to go to a protest in September of 2012. So the question I really have is, if he's still defending this active civil rights lawsuit that dates back to, to an incident from five years ago, why not find some other candidate to be the mayor's head of security? Well, uh, after he did that to that bicyclist, he's repeatedly violated my civil rights. He violated the civil rights of Nathan Tempe, a journalist in Newark Airport in last year that made the news. Um, so, with regards to one of the bills up for discussion, the right to record government officers as long as you're not violating uh, their ability to do their job, there's actually a legal precedent for that in New York City. Um, so that bill may be redundant. But what I was kind of hoping uh, through this meeting is if I could get a commitment from the New York City Council to effectively intervene to prevent the mayor's NYPD security detail from violate, continuing to violate the First Amendment, 14th Amendment rights 
of people that are looking to attend public meetings lawfully and act as a whistleblower during those meetings. For you, Mr. Um, Johnson, first time I met you was on March 15th in your town hall meeting. Um, that meeting was recorded on video. Throughout that meeting, I acted entirely lawfully. I told the mayor that the head of HRA had repeatedly lied to me about getting legal assistance. Following that meeting with you, he's continued to do that. He made a statement to me on, during the mayor's uh, November 30th town hall meeting, he lied. I got confirmation following that meeting that he lied to my face. So in terms of oversight, I know it's not s specific to this particular meeting. If you have a commissioner of HRA who's engaging in deceit and that is essentially a waste of taxpayer resources, who provides oversight of HRA? And when people like me try to go to the mayor's town hall meetings to talk to the mayor about that, if the mayor said to me face to face on December 5th that, brother, we've been over this a thousand times, and that latest lie by Mr. Banks had just occurred one week earlier, how is it possible that the mayor and I were, had, a, had a discussion about that issue over a thousand times between uh, November 30th and December 5th? That's not possible. So again, um, I told the mayor actually on July 18th about this federal lawsuit against his head of security. That was also recorded on video. The meeting was in Kew Gardens. He told me at the time he wouldn't comment about it. So if the head of the city, the top political official in the city, has stated that uh, if someone has a problem with policing, ultimately he's responsible for that. If I brought it to his attention face to face on December 5th, that I've continued to be kept out of uh, public meetings in violation of 18 U.S.C. 245, a federal criminal statute. I can give you the exact uh, provision in that uh, statute. It's under subsection B5 that talks about lawful speech, lawful assembly. So if a government official is retaliating against me while I'm engaged in lawful speech, lawful assembly, it's really up to you and your colleagues to have decisive, immediate, corrective action taken such that voters don't have to um, ha voters don't have to contend with a top political official who has al allowed tacitly allowed that to continue. I mean, I have other things to attend to. I'm sure you do. I don't want to waste your time, but you are lawmakers. You have the ability to introduce legislation. If instead of doing that, you turn your backs on the problem, the problem continues. It's just like a rapist. If a rapist isn't caught, dealt with, they just continue to do it until something is done. So I'll leave it at that, except for um, before coming here today, I also had videos that I wanted to present during my testimony. I called ahead to try to make arrangements for that. There's a U.S. Supreme Court case that talks about the right to be heard in a meaningful way at a meaningful time. So if I contacted City Hall in advance of my testimony today and specifically requested to have arrangements made such that I could present that video so that people in the audience could watch it, could make independent decisions as to whether um, I'm full of it or whether there's substance to what I'm stating. I don't see why this city council, this uh, committee, would act in defiance of an existing U.S. Supreme Court decision uh, that is f essentially about fundamental due, due process. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I don't agree with much, much of what you said, but uh, you have the, of course, legal right uh, to say it, and we didn't want to interrupt your testimony. You, you were able to say whatever you wanted, and uh, I really appreciate you coming today. Thank Anything you. Anything else, uh, no. Madam Chair? That's it. So uh, with that, we would, we're going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Have a microphone.